tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The Enchanted Snow Forest Written by Reginald Murray Performed by Peter Bishop Featuring Aidan Ordover Jesse Cornett Otis Jiry Jeff Clement Heather Ordover And Adriana Kozlowski Production by Jesse Cornett Original music by Brandon Boone and Jesse Cornett. Danny Watkins has awakened from a sound night's sleep. He looks out his bedroom window at a vague forest where there are tall evergreen trees. Those neighboring trees pretty much blocks the view of what else is beyond. For quite some time, this forest has been a mystery to him. It is Christmas morning, but a dreary gray day. Danny wonders why. He cannot worry about things he has no control over the weather for one thing. Danny is not ready to open his presents yet. If only he can get a glimpse of the remote woodlands to satisfy his curiosity, that would do the trick. He quickly gets dressed, putting on his wintry outfits and heading straight for the front door. Danny, where are you going? His mother asks. I just want to play in the snow some before I open my presents. The adventurous person says. But it's Christmas, darling. You have the rest of the day to do that, she says. I fixed some breakfast for you. It can't wait. It can, he impatiently adds. I won't be long. He closes the door behind him. Danny has lied to his mother with a straight face. Yeah. Playing by himself in the snow is quite boring. Then again, another thought enters his mind. If he could build a snowman, if only he could, perhaps the world's tallest one will suffice his needs. But he needs help. He has none. Building the world's tallest snowman facing his house is a great idea whenever he looks out his window. It would fascinate him. But I have no help. He muses the thought casually. He gives himself a reality check. Danny walks that much deeper into the silent woodlands, witnessing what it's like to be in cahoots with one of Mother Nature's treasures. His curiosity isn't satisfied. Far from it. He sees the bare trees. Winter's stinging breath has stripped fall of her variegated trees. So much for little Danny's good wishes. He has to wait another 365 days to see the sheer beauty of them. But he likes them. He notices the forest squirrels, rabbits, chipmunks, beavers and raccoons quickly scampering here and there off in the distance, cutting across the snow-covered path, running through rotten fallen logs as their safety net, and those haughty birds flying off to wherever. His eyes catch a deer, perhaps lost in its way. The deer senses little Danny's proximity. Instantly, he bounds away, fearing harm might come to him. Danny tries to keep up with the forest creature, but the animal's four strong legs are too much for the fragile legs of Danny to overtake it. Come back! Come back! Little Danny pleads with the deer. I won't harm you. It does no good. Following that animal was done for a purpose, because something else catches Danny's sight. Just up away some is a gigantic snow creature, inland just off to the left of the path. It looks to be made out of 700 pounds of snow. It is neat looking by all means. 
Danny was always fascinated on how snow creatures are made. His mother reads him bedtime stories of snowmen coming to life and aiding those in trouble. This fascinated little Danny. This one really takes the cake. He inches that much closer and closer to the snow creature to get a first-hand glimpse of what he is really like. He touches it. Instantly, the snow sculpture comes to life. It's Danny, the undersized person against the gigantic snow creature, perhaps the tallest snow structure in the world. My gosh! Danny says out loud. I've read stories about abominable snowmen, other hideous creatures, and likes of many more. I must have dreamt him up. I've never seen any come to life with one touch. The huge snow structure peers down at him with his piercing eyes, saying, Yes, I am an abominable snowman, but my deeds are good ones. Who are you? Uh, I'm Danny. He replies, introducing himself. What's your name? I'm Lauren, the abominable snowman adds. Who made you? He asks. If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. The snowman answers. Do tell. Danny urges. A long time ago, he begins, some children were playing here in this exact spot. You should know. We have all sorts of people who love the outdoors winter life. It chanced one Christmas day that they decided to build the largest snowman in the world. With the help of parents and friends, just for kicks. They built me. My rash thinking is for me to scare off any foe or beast that might come upon them unawares. Even the wild forest animals would stay their courses. What happened next? Danny asks. As you might have guessed, an evil wolf by the name of Gwalan and his miscreants caught everyone off guard. He has some dark powers. He and his cohorts penalized us. How? He used his dark magic to subdue us, the gentle snowman said. I was alive. He turned me into a snow sculpture, as you see me, and his bandits kidnapped my friends. He blew his stinging breath on me. My gosh, were they ever jolly with big hearts. Where did they take them? To a place deep in the forest, some 70 miles east of here, the snowman responded. To be exact, they are somewhere in these backwoods. He's taken them in as his hostages. Why? Danny wants to know. My guess is he has no Christmas in his dark heart. Laren answers. Poor soul. He's never experienced the true meaning of Christmas. I guess there is no Christmas in his heart. There never was. Perhaps there never will be. Fate would have it that we crossed paths for this reason. I will assist you in finding your lost friends and returning them to their rightful parents. Danny admits. Perhaps, Laren said. Well then, let's get a move on. The gleeful child mandates. 
I wish to help you, but I don't want to be late coming home. My parents are waiting for me to open up my Christmas presents. Don't worry. You won't be late. You're in an enchanted forest. Laren confirms. Our time here is different from yours. Seconds in yours is but an hour in ours. Excuse my ambiguity. As you grow older, you will see what I mean. The two new friends trek through the snow, going deep into the vast forest, until they are lost in its bosom. Snow doesn't bother Laren, since he is made out of it. Danny gets his winter chills now and again. It is chilly to a certain degree, but not biting cold. But his mind stays focused on capturing the lost children, and the fiendish wolf Gwalin. Seemingly, getting lost in this wood is like a Christmas paradise to him. He is glad he ignored his mother's wishes. The thought of him opening his presents and playing with his toys all alone sort of bores him. Danny is that kind of person that, when fully grown, he wants some outdoor adventure and company, and he has his precocity already in the making. He makes friends easily. He can adapt quickly to new surroundings. Yes, Laren and Danny have their eyes and sights set on destroying the villain. Danny happens to glance up at the sky, noticing it as a dismal gray. That bothers him. On Christmas Day, the burning sun should be shining in its brilliancy. Adding that with the freshly fallen snow from the night before can only complement each other. This wonderland would really be a haven of Christmas. These distant thoughts, however, in his open mind are vague. Why such a dreary day? He asks his newfound friend. That wretched wolf cursed the sun by putting a nasty spell on it, Laren confirms. The minute he absconded our beloved children, the sun went behind those dark clouds. It's been that way ever since. If we are victorious, the clouds will go away and let the golden sun shine its warmth this very day. If we are defeated, I'm afraid we may never see the likes of it on Christmas Day or any day. Hereafter. A sad thought. Danny solemnly objects. It seems to me that it's always a dreary, gray day here. Indeed. The snow creature agrees. Gwalin has all sorts of crazy ideas in his head. We have to be careful when dealing with him. Perhaps. That beast stole our children, and he can never steal our spirits. Danny says so in the affirmative, cheering up some. Hmm, <laughs> you're right, my boy. You're right. Laring gleefully adds. They kept walking for quite some time. Danny is overwhelmed by the wintry forest, even though it's dead winter. It's like hiking in the woods on a midsummer's day. On his right, just off the path in Lansom, are snow angels. Gee, they're neat. Danny confirms. Make one, and see what happens, Laren suggests. Danny obeys. <laughs> Instantly, a real angel emanates from it. My dear Danny, you have been called for a reason, the angel says in its echoing voice. A dark side is now hovering over these cherished woodlands. I know your heart and mind far better than you do. You will assist Lauren in capturing the lost children. When you do, you will be rewarded for your bravery and integrity. 
I will be watching from the windows of heaven. Then the snow angel ascends high in the air, disappearing. They pass by some frozen ponds and lakes, and stone-made bridges that look like they are from the Renaissance period. But they are neat looking and look sturdy. Even the bare trees add to the sheer beauty and originality of this isolated wood. They eventually come to the borders of the forest. They are standing on a small hill, overlooking a valley far below to the east, where the houses are blowing smoke freely through their brick chimneys. The quaint village seems at perfect peace with itself. Neat place, Danny says. Get on my back, Laren orders him. Since it is high winter and snow is on the ground, it won't hurt Laren. He helps the petite Danny on his back. Quickly, they glide down the hill's slope at an accelerated speed. In mere minutes, they hit the foot of the hill. Laren and Danny walk up to the first house in proximity to them. Laren knocks firmly on the wooden door three times. From within, he hears footsteps fast approaching the entrance. The door swings open. They see a normal-sized man wearing a pleasant countenance. Laren! He exclaims. You're alive again. How did that happen? Mm. I'd say you're looking at him. Laren responds, gesturing to Danny. Hello, little fella. The jolly-faced person cites. My name is Dorwin. My neighbors and I made Laren the person he is today many moons ago. But as you know, darkness has prevailed over our village. So I've been told... Danny reminds him. I've heard your enemy is a wolf chief by the name of Gwalin. He kidnapped your friends. Do come in and join me for some hot chocolate and cookies. Dorwin ingratiates himself with the newcomer. Laren, since he is made out of snow, patiently waits outside. The icy weather and snow cannot hurt him. Danny, meanwhile, follows the friendly fellow into his kitchen. Both seat themselves at a wooden table and engage themselves in a deep conversation over what has transpired. So Gwalin absconded with your friends? He did, the neighbor acknowledges. He's trying to take the joy out of Christmas. He's stolen our tangibles, but not our intangibles. I think what he means is... Danny expresses... He cannot take Christmas out of our hearts. That stone-cold moron. His heart is as cold as a block of ice. Dorwin angrily objects. Our children are our greatest gifts to us. Nothing can ever replace that. Perhaps you and Lauren are the answers to his terrible deeds. So that's why we met by happenstance. Danny confirms. They take some more sips out of their hot chocolate and bites out of their cookies before engaging in some more of their plain talk. Which direction did he take him? Danny asks. Some 70 miles east of here, Dorwin retorts. They are imprisoned in his wooden cottage. I'd be extremely careful if I were y'all. Those woods are haunted and dreary, to say the least. What's his reasoning? Danny wants to know. My thinking is, he is envious of those who celebrate Christmas. The person informs. Christmas is a time of season to forgive, forget, and share. He can do none. <sighs> My friend has a warped soul. Danny admits. They chew and chat some more at length before Laren hollers from outside and tells them that they better get going. The only Christmas present I want from you is to bring them back. 
safe and alive. Darwin wants. We'll conquer the beast. Danny promises. In mere minutes, he and Laren are off in another set of woods, the haunted woods, to secure the lost children. They eventually reach the perimeter of the spooky forest. It does have a disturbing presence about it once they step into it. There is an eerie silence. Some of the trees are ugly and distorted. Laren and Danny notice the skeleton remains of the forest creatures lying still as stone. Perhaps Gwalan and his miscreants got hold of the hapless rabbits, deers, and goodness knows what else they could eat for their meals. Laren thinks gloomily to himself. Just up a ways is a wooden cottage that is burning smoke freely through its chimney. As they approach the doorway entrance, five or six wolves come from out of hiding, howling, snarling, and salivating freely at their mouths, like they are ready to take them as their main course meals. Their evil eyes are red in guise. Back off, thieves! Laren orders them in his dictatorial, booming voice, not at all intimidated by them. They turn and run in disarray, in all kinds of directions, howling. Gee, you do have some rough edges when threatened. Danny notes. Only when I'm threatened. Laren further confirms. They eventually come to the doorsteps of Gwaylin's front entrance. Laren knocks. No one answers. He knocks a second time. Still, no answers come. What do you suppose? Danny asks, whispering. Mm, he's probably out doing more of his mischief. Laren answers. He's planning on seeing who else he can abscond. He slowly turns the doorknob as quietly as possible. The door swings open. In they walk silently, with extreme caution. A terrible odor hits their nostrils. They withstand it, looking for the captives. They quickly go downstairs to the basement. They see four helpless children securely tied sitting on the basement floor in an unorthodox position. There are rags around their mouths so they cannot holler for help, and strong ropes around their delicate ankles, making it next to impossible to escape. Quickly, Laren runs up to the kitchen. Retrieves a kitchen knife, cutting their ropes, giving them their freedom. One of the jubilant persons announces. Let's get out of here before he finds out we're free! A young girl proclaims. Up the cellar steps they quickly fly, in single file, one closely behind the other. In mere seconds they hit the front door, making their way as fast as can be back to their secluded village. Stay close! Laren encourages them. Gwaylin and the pack of wolves eventually return to his cottage. They are in for a rude awakening. I don't understand it. I had them securely tied here in the basement. The wolf tells one of his servants in his gruff tone. How did they manage to escape? With the help of somebody. The servant returns his answer. Gwaylin notices a knife lying on the floor. This is part of our answer points to the knife. They go outside and see two sets of footprints in the snow. One is small, the others are gigantic. Instantly, he reads between the lines, knowing that Laren, the snow creature, came back to life somehow. These are Laren's tracks. The others are possibly your kids. How did 
did he come back to life? Asked the second servant of his. I thought you put a curse on him. I did. He was probably touched by a warm-hearted child. This is an enchanted forest. The wolf chief confirms. Anything can happen in this forest. Anything. What now, my lord? The assistant asks. We'll go after them. Gwalin responds. My guess is they want Christmas restored in their hearts. They sniff the perimeters of the snow-covered ground, hoping to pick up their scent. They do. After them! Gwalin mandates in his bossy tone. The howling wolves run off at a racer's pace through the sinister forest, searching for their hostages. They can't find them fast enough. The four hostages are quickly reunited with their parents, relishing every moment of their safe return. Well, Danny, we better get going. Larin comments. As the two heroes distance themselves from the village, they hear loud howlings from the haunted forest. They turn and see Gwalin and the pack of wolves hot on their trails. There's too many of them to hold off! The frightened Danny Watkins pleads. Stay here! Larin tells. Where are, you, where are you going? Danny inquires. To the very top of this hill. The snowman answers. Larin uses his long legs and flies up the peak at an accelerated pace. Meanwhile, Waylin and his gang have the look of destruction in their eyes. They are fast closing the gap on their escapees. At the same time, Larin reaches the top. A very funny thing happens in Danny's eyesights. Larin transforms himself into a snow avalanche. Stand aside, Danny! He hollers down in his booming voice. Danny obeys. A tiny ball of snow starts rolling down the hill, picking up speed and growing enormous in size. Simultaneously, Gwalin and his cohorts are in close proximity of capturing Danny, ignoring the snow avalanche. The ball of snow continues to grow, gaining size and full speed, heading straight for the enemies. It does great harm to the wolf pack. They misjudge its speed and power. The snowman turned avalanche easily overtakes them, burying them deep underneath. Danny hears faint howling underneath, realizing it is their deathbeds. Gwalin and company are like popsicles, frozen in time. Laren then converts himself back into the snow person he is. Both he and Danny cast their sunny-like smiles, as bright as a crystal clear day. Then something else catches their naked eyes. The dismal clouds give way to the burning sun, making the enchanted forest very scenic and alive. Afar off, they see the children come out and merrily celebrate Gwalin's demise. They can't get enough. Eventually, the citizens plant the world's largest Christmas tree with a golden star sitting comfortably on top, shining in its brilliance. After that short-lived triumph, Danny and Laren are back at the exact location where all their high adventures began earlier. Well, Danny, this is why we crossed paths. Larin confirms. We did! Danny acknowledges. That was quite an adventure. Christmas is more than just receiving, Larin notes. It's about giving and giving back to those in dire need of love. It's about being free-handed and giving abundantly. One may steal our products, but not our spirits. I'm grateful we crossed paths, Danny adds. 
No amount of bad can withstand a spark of good. <laughs> well put, my boy. I was your learning tree of a sort. Laring confesses. Danny, it is most unwise to walk into any land without knowing what's at stake. Always do your homework before entering any uncharted territory. Well, you better get going. But I want to stay here somewhere and celebrate Christmas with you. You already have. Laren sights. You celebrated Christmas with me by bringing me back to life so I could rescue the lost children. These forests are safe once again. Now, it's time for you to return to your real world. Go. But Lauren, it's still early. He asserts. I said, go. The gentle giant kindly puts it to Danny. Danny obliges. Danny walks away a few paces and turns to say his last goodbyes. The snowman has turned back into a snow sculpture. It's sort of a letdown to Danny. Oh well. He casually thinks to himself. It's best for the both of us, I guess. This is an imaginary forest, after all. Mom? Danny, where have you been? I've been looking all over for you. Is the worried voice of his mother. Just wanted to satisfy my curiosity some. Danny confirms. I was in the forest, but I didn't go deep in it. He is lying with a straight face, not telling his mother the naked truth. He theorizes that no one will believe him. How many times do I have to tell you that forest isn't safe? She asks. I've heard wild stories about a ravenous wolf that kidnapped some children years ago. The kids were never found. I was afraid he might have added you to his short list. How did you know a wolf existed? Danny asks, not revealing to his mum that he encountered the evil creature. She wouldn't take his words, because he is just a boy. Grown-ups don't believe anything children tell them. Wolves come upon you unawares, she warns. I've seen them occasionally. They're killing machines. They live in the forests. Well, I'm alive, he adds. You are, but you still don't know the dangers lurking there, she warns him. Let's go inside and open up your presents. Both enter the house. Danny turns and looks at the forest with a bright smile. There once was a very well-behaved eight-year-old boy named Miles. He did all the things that good children are supposed to do, nearly all the time. He ate all his vegetables, unless they were carrots. He completed all of his school assignments, except for that one time he forgot to finish his homework. He was always nice to his friends, unless you count that one time when he yelled at his schoolmate Tony. And he never spoke back to his parents or got mad at them with very rare exceptions. Yes, he was nearly perfect, and he was a joy for his parents to raise almost all the time. That boy existed more than 30 years ago, and in a matter of speaking, he still exists. That boy, <laughs> he's me, and he will always be part of who I am. I can remember every transgression I made as a child, not only because there were so few of them, but because they ended up shaping my life in a way you could never imagine. Of all my misdeeds, the one that stands out most vividly is the very last time I yelled at my parents. The funny thing is, even though I can remember being mad and I can remember every word I said, I don't recall exactly why I was upset. When I try to think of the reason, it's like looking at a blank sheet of paper in my mind. I can tell you that it wasn't anything that my adult self would find consequential, but I know it felt important at the time. It was two days before Christmas, 
and the words I spoke felt foreign as they came out of my mouth, probably because I'd never said anything quite like it before. Go away! I don't want you to be here anymore! I don't want you to talk to me ever again! I could see the hurt in my parents' eyes as I unleashed my tirade towards them. Even now, I'm surprised at what a profound effect the words from my eight-year-old self had on them. Their dismay was mixed with obvious shock upon hearing me lash out. My mother had a look on her face that was confused, sad, and angry all at the same time. My father was harder to read, but I knew he wasn't happy. Sadly, the looks on their faces are among the last memories I have of my parents. Their distraught scowls are burned in my mind. Two visages that are now a permanent part of my psyche. By the time Christmas Eve came around, all had been forgiven. Whatever the issue had been, it was resolved. My mother cooked a special ham dinner, and we had a roaring fire going. The house was warm and extra comfortable, and in the hours after dinner, I sat and sipped from a mug of hot cocoa with peppermint. I no longer believed in Santa Claus, but that didn't stop me from feeling a natural yuletide excitement. I fell asleep that night, staring at the dazzling lights and shining ornaments that clung to our Christmas tree. I vaguely remember my father carrying me to my bedroom and giving me a little kiss on my forehead. I awoke later that night to the feeling of someone poking their finger into my back. Wake up, kid. It was a voice I'd never heard before. A man's voice, with a slight drawl. My eyes opened widely as I instinctively rolled out of bed in an outright panic. I fell to the floor and screamed for my father. I was trapped in a corner of my bedroom. I could see the man's silhouetted figure looming clearly in front of me. A small red glow came from a cigarette in his hand. I froze in fear of this stranger who had invaded my home. The man spoke to me again. Quiet down. He can't hear you right now anyhow. He put his cigarette to his lips and inhaled deeply. As he did, his face illuminated by the red glow, and I could see his deep set eyes, his dirty fingers, and his long black hair. But kid, I can hear you. I can hear you better than anyone in ways you can't understand. He pointed at the side of his forehead as he spoke. I didn't reply, but even through my fear, I couldn't help but wonder who the man was. He nodded as if he knew exactly what I was thinking. So, you'd like to know who I am? Well, I'm the guy who's tuned into your mind. I'm the guy that's been around for a long time. And most importantly, I'm the guy who gives kids what they ask for. He looked straight into my eyes, invading my mind and reading my thoughts. No, kid, I ain't Santa. He was agitated. You stupid. Do I really look like that overweight elf? No, man. I'm much better. I don't judge and I don't discriminate. I give kids what they ask for. The good kids and the bad kids. I finally found the courage to speak, even though he seemed to have no trouble answering my questions before I even asked them. I... I... didn't ask for anything. My voice trembled as I spoke. Sure you did. You wanted your parents to go away. I heard that loud and clear. Loud and clear. Not very nice of you. I'd say that makes you a bad little boy, but don't worry, like I said, I don't discriminate. But I don't want them to go away. He shook his head. You said it. You meant it at the time. I heard it. I don't hear all the kids, just some of them, and I heard you loudest of all. Tears began streaming down my face but their presence didn't seem to change the visitor's demeanor towards me. Well, kid, I just wanted to meet you and see whose voice has been screaming in my head the past few days. 
He turned and started walking towards the door. I gotta get started. It's time to give you your gift and get a gift for myself too. Merry Christmas, kid. He flicked his cigarette into the corner of my bedroom as he passed through the doorway, repeating himself as he walked down the hallway in the direction of my parents' room. Merry Christmas. The door to my bedroom shut, even though the man himself had made no effort to close it. I screamed aloud for my mother and father. To this day, I still have no idea if they heard me. I wish I could tell you that I bravely ran out of my bedroom to warn them, but I just sat, huddled in a corner, crying and afraid. I listened intently for sounds of struggle, or for my parents yelling, but I couldn't hear anything. Hours passed, and I watched the sky turn from black to gray, then to orange. I waited for my mother and father to find me. The orange sky turned blue as the day wore on, but they never came. An absolute silence hung over the house. Yet still, I sat there. It was well into the afternoon when I finally left my room. I knew I couldn't stay there forever. I tiptoed slowly to my door and opened it only a few inches. Looking out from the inside of my room, the door appeared normal. Everything I could see was in its place. I pulled the door open all the way almost expecting the man from the night before to jump out at me, but that didn't happen. My voice broke the silence. Mom? Dad? No response. Trying my best to stay quiet, I walked slowly down the hallway towards my parents' bedroom. Their door was ajar. Dad? I put my hand on their door. Mom? pushed it open and looked inside. I don't actually remember what I saw. To be clear, I'm perfectly aware of the fate that befell my parents, based on what was told to me later on, but I have no memory of the actual sight that I witnessed during that one awful moment. It's a traumatic event that my sane mind has blocked out. Even today, when I recreate the events of that night in my dreams, the scene fades to white as I push the door open. My next memory is of me lying down in the street directly outside of my house, screaming and flailing my arms wildly. The Porter family, who lived next door, witnessed my distress through their living room window. Mr. Porter exited his house and rushed over to me. He could tell something was seriously wrong. They're dead! It was all I could say. I repeated it again and again. Mrs. Porter followed closely behind her husband and comforted me as he went to check inside my house. A minute later, he exited and promptly vomited in the bushes. Nobody ever told me the whole story of what they found in that bedroom, at least not directly. It was explained to me that a very bad person had broken into my house and murdered my parents, even though I already knew as much. What was held back from me at the time was the fact that they had been decapitated. The cuts were clean, almost surgical. Both bodies were laying on the bed as if they had been asleep when it happened. The worst part was that their heads were missing, not to be found anywhere. Their bodies were sliced open. The strange symbols were drawn on the wall in blood. Other than the carnage itself, absolutely no physical evidence was discovered at the scene. Not one fingerprint, stray hair, or footprint was left behind. Nothing. The police listened to my story once I was ready to talk. I found out later I was considered to be an unreliable witness, mostly because the details of my story didn't mesh with the lack of physical evidence. A specially trained detective... Also, my new therapist sat down with me to review what I'd told the police earlier. The man, he wasn't wearing gloves, shook my head no. 
I clearly remembered the cigarette in his hand. There was no glove. And he threw the cigarette on the ground when he was done smoking it. I nodded yes. And he closed the door when you left your room. I shook my head no, and thought about it, and nodded my head yes. I wasn't really sure. The detective took notes as I talked. He nodded his head pleasantly, but even then, I could see the strange look on his face when I told him that the man had read my thoughts. The one thing I never told the police was that two days before the murders, I'd asked my parents to be gone. The sketch artist came by afterwards. He started off by drawing some smurfs for me. Then he slowly began working me up to the task of remembering what the murderer looked like. I appreciated his effort. When he was done, the picture looked somewhat like how I remembered the man, but not exactly. I was taken in by my mother's sister, Aunt Janine, and her husband, my Uncle Anton. As unlucky as I had been with the deaths of my parents, I have to say, I was nearly as lucky to have those two in my life. Other than my parents, they were probably the best people in the world who I could have lived with. Looking back at the events of my life, I have to say that today, I miss them every bit as much as I miss my parents. Janine worked as an office manager, but she took a leave of absence in the first few months after the murders so that she could be home to support me. Anton worked for a home security firm. He was the kind of man who always had a smile on his face, so much so that it would be impossible for a person to even imagine him angry. He made instant connections with people, and he had a confidence about him that made people want to seek his approval, whether consciously or unconsciously. Janine and Anton didn't have any children of their own, and they'd always been very generous towards me. I knew them well, so it was easy for me to slip into their lives. I put a huge effort into making sure that I gave them no trouble, and I asked them for nothing. My conversation with the murderer was never too far from my thoughts, and I could hear an amalgamation of his comments ring through my mind daily. I give kids what they ask for, the good kids and the bad kids. I didn't know what the good kids were given by this man. I understood all too clearly what happened to the bad children. It was two months before I felt like I was ready to go back to school. Janine and Anton, and even the school administration, were very helpful and understanding throughout the whole process. My classmates welcomed me back with smiles and words of encouragement. It's often said that children can be cruel, but I think it's even more true that they can be sweet and supportive. I really can't emphasize enough how much returning to all my friends helped me along in the healing process. My anxiety began to ebb, and my therapist proclaimed that it was a major milestone for me. Despite the progress in my psychological healing, there were always several thoughts that I couldn't rid myself of. The first was the guilt that I felt about asking for my parents to go away. I knew full well the murder of my parents was in no way my fault, but there was always that nagging voice that wouldn't let it drop. I'd ask for them to be taken away, and that's exactly what had happened. The second thought was that the murderer would return again the following Christmas. Initially, all the adults assured me that he would be arrested quickly. Then, when that didn't happen... I was promised that there was no way he could ever get his hands on me, and that I was safe. I made sure that I was never left alone, and when Janine went back to work, she only did so part-time so that she could pick me up when school let out. I also had difficulty with the more unbelievable aspects of what happened that night. I tried to convince myself on a daily basis that the murderer was just a normal man, and that my memory of those fantastical elements was merely my own imagination betraying me. But just like the guilt I felt, the troubling thought that this man was more than just a man didn't subside entirely. For victims of trauma, anniversaries can often trigger symptoms like depression and fear. 
For me, Christmas was the anniversary of my worst memory. As the summer ended, Janine and Anton, along with my therapist, decided early on that Christmas wouldn't be celebrated in our household that year. Nobody felt that I'd be ready for it. And they were right. Since we knew that Christmas was going to be an ordinary day for us, Janine and Anton made sure to throw me a huge birthday party in October of that year, when I turned nine. It seemed like most of the community turned out. We had a bounce house, ponies, and even a magician. Everyone, including me, had a great day. It was probably the first time in ten months that I'd grinned. Sure, there had been smiles up to that point. But I'm referring to the type of grin where your teeth show and the elation on your face can't be mistaken. Unfortunately, the joy of my birthday couldn't last forever. Inevitably, the signs of Christmas slowly started popping up not long after Halloween passed, and my anxiety started increasing. Though we weren't going to celebrate it, Christmas would be impossible to ignore. Holiday lights, store displays, television commercials, yuletide songs pumped over public address systems. How can one avoid all those and still function within society? Though those harbingers couldn't be avoided altogether, Janine and Anton made a concerted effort to minimize my exposure. Instead of letting me watch my TV shows, Anton taught me the game of chess, which we played nightly. For the most part, they avoided taking me to any stores and kept me home, or close by, as much as possible. Avoiding these triggers probably helped somewhat, but I still couldn't get rid of the tightening feeling in my chest that I felt every morning when I woke up. I managed to avoid any sort of breakdown until the 21st of December. Aunt Janine, because she was taking care of me, had herself been staying home an inordinate amount of time. Finally. After our fifth game of rummy in a row, she'd had enough. She tossed her cards aside. You know what, Miles? We've been cooped up too long. Let's get out of here. We'll go get ice cream. One little trip out won't hurt, right? I smiled in response. Okay. Ice cream sounded good, even in the middle of December. Aunt Janine, who was talkative by nature, kept the conversation flowing all the way to the ice cream shop. I suppose this was her attempt to keep my focus away from the lights and displays that we passed. And it worked, too. Ask a kid questions about his favorite superheroes, and he's going to get fairly preoccupied while he talks about them, even the quiet ones. We made it into the shop. I ordered a double scoop of chocolate fudge brownie. We sat down and ate our treats, with Aunt Janine still engaging me in conversation. Just for a brief moment... A nearby toy store's glittering Christmas display caught my eye through the window. They had a life-size poster plastered in their display window. It was a picture of Santa upon a rooftop, poised in a position as if he were just about ready to climb down the chimney. Blazing Christmas lights surrounded the display, and large words spilled out. What do you want for Christmas? I tried to turn away, but the colorful lights clouded my vision enlarging in their scope until they all combined, finally creating a great white light. Miles? Miles? My aunt's voice was becoming more and more urgent. I suddenly realized she'd been calling my name for several moments. A cup of ice cream dropped from my hand. I... I just want them back. At that moment, the tears flowed freely. I could think of nothing else. I was hysterical. Aunt Janine quickly came to my side of the table. God, Miles, I'm so sorry. She grabbed me and hugged me tightly. I reciprocated, holding on to her as firmly as I could. This was a bad idea. I'm so sorry, sweetie. I'm sorry I brought you out. That was stupid of me. I'm so sorry I missed them, too. It took at least 15 minutes for Aunt Janine to calm me to the point where we could leave the shop. We left our unfinished ice creams behind. No other incidents happened in the next couple of days and my interactions with Anton and Janine helped distract me. Finally, it was Christmas Eve. I was quiet all day long, even more so than usual. Anton noticed and had a talk with me after dinner. You okay, buddy? I nodded my head yes. Despite my assurance that I was okay, he could tell I wasn't. He knew almost exactly what was on my mind. Come here, Miles. Let me show you a few things. 
I followed him to the living room window where he moved the curtains aside. See these windows? He slapped his hand on the pane to show me how solid it was. This is the strongest window that they make for residences. My company installed these. They're unbreakable, and there's no way someone can open them from outside. I stared at the window, while on the other side, blackness enveloped the house. He took me over to the door. See how strong this is? It would take a tank to knock this door down. The back door, too, and there's no way in. He led me over to the alarm control panel that was on the wall. This is the best system that they make. I installed it myself. He kneeled down to my level. Miles, you're safe here. Nobody, and I mean nobody, can get in here unless we let them in. He glanced to the side with his eyes. And don't tell your aunt I showed you this. He moved his coat aside so that I could see the holstered pistol he was wearing. Just some added protection, but I won't even need this. I nodded, feeling a little bit safer, but not completely. I still worried. Not only for myself, but for Janine and Anton as well. Bedtime approached, and Aunt Janine, with the insight usually reserved for long-time mothers, knew the one thing that might make the night a little easier for me. Miles, do you want to sleep in our room tonight? She asked. Yes. I smiled and nodded at the invitation. We would all be able to look out for each other. They'd protect me, and I'd be able to warn them if someone came in. They put the soft blankets on the ground for me, right next to their bed. It was in a nice protected spot in the large gap between the bed and the wall. I couldn't fall asleep for several hours, but I could hear both Janine and Anton begin their nightly slumbers. Their breathing became rhythmic and almost melodic. I listened intently for any noises that might have been out of the ordinary, but nothing abnormal sounded out. There was a clock ticking somewhere in the house, and the occasional car passed by outside. Finally, my weariness overpowered my uneasiness, and I began my night's sleep. The dream I had that night was unlike any other I'd had before. I was in what appeared to be a large garage, the type where mechanics worked on cars. All around me, automotive parts were spread out along the ground, tires were stacked up, and an old rusted chassis filled the center of the room. Grime dripped from the walls. The area was lit by a single overhead lamp. I instantly knew I was dreaming, even though it was the first time I'd experienced a lucid dream. From the corner of the garage, I heard metal clanking turned around to face the sound, and out of the darkness, the man who'd taken the lives of my parents emerged. He spit some phlegm onto the ground and wiped his mouth before addressing me. Hey, kid. <laughs> Don't worry. I ain't gonna hurt you. I'd like to, though. I'd really like to be able to shut you up, but it don't work that way. Despite my grimy surroundings, and perhaps because it was just a dream, this didn't feel like a place of anger or fear. Unlike the year before, I was able to find my voice right away. Why do you want to shut me up? I hardly ever even speak. When you consider some of the other obvious questions, I know it may sound strange that I chose to open with that. Who was this man? And why did he take interest in me? Those were the questions I was really thinking, but my participation in the dream was guided, as if my actions weren't wholly my own. The man finally responded. Hell, you quiet ones are the loudest of all. Y'all never stop thinking. Thought after thought, you kids can't ever just shut your brains off. Give me just one loud mouth. Those kids never think about anything. Tell you what. If it was up to me, I'd just rip your heads off and be done with it. But like I said, it don't work that way. I ain't allowed to hurt a child. I looked around and came to a slow realization. This isn't my dream, is it? That's a stupid question. You ever dreamed of a place like this? Of course not. This is my dream, kid. I'm parked right outside your house. I just wanted to take a moment to peek in on you. 
My fear of this man, which had been otherwise controlled to this point, slowly began creeping back. He saw the look of despair spread across my face. Have you been a good boy this year? He gave a little chuckle. Actually, yes, you have been. Do you remember what I said last time? I give kids what they ask for, the good ones and the bad ones. I shook my head. I didn't ask for anything. I spoke with a confidence that I didn't really feel. Sure you did. You kids always asking for something. And don't you worry now, cause you're gonna get it. The room and the man began to fade away. See you next year, kid. I get the feeling you and I are gonna be part of each other's lives for a long time. Those were the last words I heard. Pure whiteness consumed me, and then I slept peacefully. My eyes opened. Outside the window, I could see the gray sky that signaled the approaching dawn. The house was eerily quiet. Too quiet. I stayed fixed in my room, on the floor, listening for signs of life from my aunt and uncle, but I could only hear my own heartbeat. I wanted to sit up and look over to them. But I was afraid of what I'd find. The dream had felt so real. I wasn't sure what to think. I continued to listen. Please, I whispered to myself. Let me hear them breathe. Several minutes passed. I still heard nothing. Tears began streaming down my face, and my pillow became wet. I knew deep inside that eventually I would have to look and see if they were okay. I couldn't lie on the floor all day, but my gut instinct told me that I didn't want to witness what was up there. Drawing upon my deepest strengths, I put my hands over my eyes and sat up. Slowly, I moved a single finger away from my teary eye. There was no blood, no gore. I pulled my hands fully away from my face. I could see Uncle Anton's chest clearly rise and fall. He was sleeping peacefully, very quietly. Aunt Janine turned in her sleep and mumbled a few nonsense words before resuming her silent rest. I smiled, and then I laughed in relief. I could see no evidence that the man had been there. It was still early, but any sense of sleepiness had been pushed away by my earlier feeling of dread. I stood up and walked over to the mirrored closet door. I looked at my red eyes and wiped them dry, while behind me, I could see the reflection of my aunt and uncle sleeping soundly. There was no need to wake them. I left the room with the intent of getting something to eat, most likely a bowl of cereal. I walked down the hallway and passed by the alarm panel on the wall. All the lights were green, the doors, the windows, they were all secure. Nobody could have gotten in. Now, fully relaxed, I passed through the living room on my way to the dining area. That's when I saw it sitting right on top of the dining room table. I froze in place and looked all around to see if there was anything else out of place, but everything else was as it should have been. I turned again to the table and stared at the beautifully wrapped gift box that definitely hadn't been there the night before. It was a large box, maybe about 18 inches square. The wrapping paper that covered it was bright red with sparkles all over it. A pretty green bow covered the top. My aunt and uncle had agreed that we wouldn't be celebrating Christmas that year. Yet, there sat a gift box atop the dining room table. I wondered if they'd change their minds. I walked slowly towards the gift, step by step. I stood up on one of the dining room chairs so that I could see the top of the gift. Whoever had wrapped it had taken their time. The box's lid was wrapped separately from the box itself. I lifted it up, and then I peered inside. There was no fate white for me that time. No. I saw exactly what was in the box, and simultaneously, three truths occurred to me. The first truth was that the man had been in my house. Despite all the security measures, he'd gotten in and out without raising a single alarm. The second truth was that the man had been right. I'd asked for something without even realizing it. The third truth 
was the sinking acceptance that his visits would be an annual occurrence. I stood there on the chair, staring into my parents' dried-out eyes, which were still in their decapitated heads, which were both in the box. I'd said I'd wanted them back, and the man, however he did it, had heard me and granted my wish in a manner of benefiting his evil ways. The ultimate truth that I learned from that day was that there could be no mess-ups with my behavior, and I could want for nothing. I was being constantly watched, and my mind was being continuously invaded. Bad actions would be severely punished, and even good behavior would lead to its own sick and twisted reward. And that's the story of how a very well-behaved boy became the perfectly behaved boy. And as a perfectly behaved boy, all my desires had to be held in check. Emotionally speaking, I had to become less than human, so that the visitor would have no fuel for the wicked game he played. Of course, nobody is truly perfect. There were slip-ups throughout the following years, times when I inadvertently made a wish or asked for something. Those slip-ups were very costly to me, but I don't care to recount the full extent of them here. I think I've given enough of myself for tonight. I'm weary and beaten, but what I will tell you is that after thirty years, I'm no longer afraid to finally say that I want the painful memories to go away. I don't want them anymore. I even said it out loud. I want the memories to be gone. It's cold outside right now, and it's getting late. I think I'll make myself a cup of hot cocoa with some peppermint before turning in. That will make me happy. For the first time in ages, I'm calm and at peace. Looking out the window, I could see all the pretty lights on the eaves of the houses. I don't think I ever really had the chance to appreciate just how festive they make everything look. For a long time, I just didn't care. But now, I'm going to take a few minutes to enjoy them while I can. Good night, everyone. And Merry Christmas. Christ. I muttered to myself as the first flakes of snow started to fall. They gathered in fuzzy clumps over the windshield before my wipers cleared them away. I'd been waiting for fifteen, no, twenty minutes now, in my sister's driveway. Had I chosen to wait inside with her, I'd have been dead by now thanks to her two gray cats. Cute little devils, but murdered in my sinuses. Puffy eyes and clogged up throat, that's just what I needed. Every Christmas, our family made the annual trip to my grandparents' cabin tucked away in the woods of Hope, Alaska, and I'd hoped to beat the heavy snowfall that was forecasted. Since my sister's license was suspended from a DUI, here I was, a hostage to time, with my finger tapping anxiously on the steering wheel. When my mother had asked me to be the one to grab my sister, I had honestly dreaded it from the start. It wasn't that we hated one another, we just weren't as close anymore. After decades of constant arguments and bitter disagreements, we became distant and our relationship fizzled. Yes, we were siblings, but it felt more accurate to call us the residue of what siblings once were. Finally, like the gates of Valhalla, her front door opened and out she came. Her hair was forest green. The last time I'd seen her, it had been white. The time before that, it was violet. Got everything? I asked as she clambered her way into the passenger seat. Hmm, she responded as she adjusted her glasses and stuffed a few bags in the back seat. And just like that, we were off. Hope was about a 30 minute drive, and it didn't take long for the awkward silence to inflate between us. It didn't help that the radio didn't work in my car, and that the broken auxiliary port made your music sound like it was having a seizure. 
By the time we reached the turnoff for Hope Highway, the road was turning into a thick white sheet. Thankfully, on Christmas Eve night, the long stretch to Hope's small community was quick and vacant. The cabin was tucked away in a fortress of trees five miles off the main road. As I made the turn, my sister cracked the window, pulled out a blunt, and lit it with her lighter. Wanna hit? She asked. Snow crunched beneath us. Not while I'm driving. It's a straight path. We're practically there already. She took a drag and blew it out the window. I just want to focus on this, all right? She huffed and pushed up her glasses. If you're that worried, maybe slow down a bit then. There was the jab. A piece of bait to lure me into another fight. But I wasn't going to bite. Not this time. She could live with us getting there faster. The drive was almost over, and soon I'd be in a warm living room with my feet up, a spiked eggnog in my hand, and Bobby Helm's Jingle Bell Rock in the air. I could already hear Uncle Jed spouting off one of his crude jokes. Why does Santa Claus have such a big... Dude! My sister shrieked, jabbing a finger in my side and whipping my mind back to the windshield. The car had just finished winding around the thick trail. The large body of a reindeer stood in our path. Eyes wide open and blank, it didn't move as the high beams found it. Snapped into a panic, I twisted the wheels in a desperate swerve. The car veered greasily to one side in a fine spray of slosh. The reindeer, also known as a caribou, remained still, even as the bumper soared inches from its nose. We came to a crunching halt off the main path. Jesus, I sighed with blessed relief. Did we hit it? No, my sister said, leaning out the window to check while exhaling another plume of smoke. I wound the steering wheel back around and pressed on the gas. The wheels shrilled in place, kicking up globs of sleet but not moving an inch. Perfect, I moaned and unfolded myself from the back seat to check it out. The two front tires were caked in black slush and practically swallowed in a mound of snow. I kicked at it, trying to clear off the icy debris from the treads and beneath the wheel well. When that tired me out, I resorted to scraping it off with my fingers. Screw off, Prancer, I heard my sister call toward the dark silhouette of the reindeer, its antlers like gnarled fingers reaching for the treetops. Then she made sort of a startled yip, followed by a what the fuck? I looked up from the scrim of snow. The reindeer was now standing tall on both of its hind legs. It looked strange, like a silly caricature you'd see in a kid's book. But out there, in the silence of the woods, it was a creepy image. The way its vague shape stood on just two legs held an almost human-like balance. For whatever reason, I realized then, it didn't have a tail. Its muscular neck craned to the side and it let out an ululating scream. A miserable squeal of metal grinding against metal. My legs were ice sculptures, cementing me to the spot as the shriek quieted to a succession of wet grunts. The reindeer dropped down to its original posture and stomped heavily. Puffs of white vapor and strings of snot vented from its nostrils. I was no hunter, but it didn't take a lot to tell when a pissed off animal was about to charge. I leaped for the driver's seat, pulled the door open, and slammed it shut just as the muffled thud of hooves reached me. Antlers scraped the door as its large body practically flew over the patch I had just been standing in. Fast. Very fast. My sister screamed as the large bulk of its frame wound back around and charged again, this time shattering the headlights and submerging us in darkness. Just go already, my sister hollered in my ear. I'm trying, goddammit, I hissed. The wheels continued to spin helplessly. We were trapped. The creature charged again, this time nailing the window. A cobweb of cracks bloomed near my sister's head. I searched for anything, literally anything that I could use as a weapon. I was never really a gun enthusiast, but at that moment I'd have shaved my head and joined the secular monks if it meant having a Glock in my hand right then and there. After rattling the car once more, the reindeer finally appeared to lose interest and disappeared amidst the cluster of trees. Granted some time to breathe and think, we phoned our dad and told him about the situation. He was going to come down with his pickup and get us unstuck out of this mess. I looked over at my sister who was taking long and steady breaths between her fingers. Are you alright? I asked. What do you think? 
she grumbled. I told you to slow down. Another jab, and this time I wasn't going to have it. You want to be useful? I yelled. Get out there and push. No? Then shut the hell up. I don't need it right now. She said nothing else, and neither did I, returning once again to the pocket of silence that our relationship succumbed to. The sooner Dad's headlights peaked in the distance, the better. Suddenly, she rolled the window down. What are you doing? I asked. Shh. She pursed her lips. Just listen. Humoring her, I waited, and sure enough, the sound reached me too. The quiet voice of a little girl coming from outside. Somebody, it whimpered. I'm lost. Please help me. I'm lost. My sister unlocked the door and motioned to it. I grabbed her wrist. What are you doing? She snapped. There's someone out there. Just wait a second. It's weird, isn't it? The voice continued to whine, choking between sobs and pleading for someone, anyone, to help her. I didn't like the way it sounded. The same lasting drawl between words. The same weeping sounds. Like someone was hitting repeat on a speaker. Something wasn't right, and my instincts were hoisting red flags left and right. Then my sister looked at me, and her expression warped into shock. She flung back, pinning both her shoulders against the interior. Things that sounded like words bubbled up and didn't quite make it out of her throat. I turned and saw what was looking at me. It had the face of a man, surrounded by the mottled fur of a caribou's body. The skin was a mummified brown color wound tightly around its long, skull-like old crinkled leather. Snowflakes landed upon its wide, expressionless eyes and melted into the dark membranes of its pupils. It circled the car, bobbing its antlers and fogging up the windows as it peered inside. My heart shook the walls of my throat. I locked eyes with my sister, unable to say anything behind the sheer disbelief. I should have grabbed my phone, snapped a photo, recorded a video, anything, but my thoughts were jangled. It then let out that same horrible scream, but I didn't see its tight, contorted lips open. The sound was coming from its neck. Small, fleshy orifices, flapping open like mouths, were converting the high-pitched shrill into the mimicking cry of a little girl. Help me. I'm lost. Help me. Headlights glazed the area. My father's pickup came into view, paving its way down the path. The reindeer, or whatever the fuck it was, ran off, vanishing once again into the snow-covered thicket. Nobody believed us. Why would they? If anybody had told me that story, I would have assumed they were hopped up on some crazy psychedelic. But the reality of what I saw was cold, and it's still something to this day can't fully swallow. Instead of sleeping that night, my sister and I did some research that led us to the myth of skinwalkers. Beings of some sort, capable of mimicking voices and disguising themselves as animals to lure people into the woods. After reading other accounts, there wasn't a doubt in my mind what we'd witnessed out there. Every so often that night, I'd stare out the window and eye the yard, wondering if I'd see that leathery face watching from the tree line. Neither I nor my sister ever made that trip again much to the frustration of my family, but there was a silver lining. She and I have never been closer. It began when Tommy G decided we were going to emulate a Wiccan ritual he found in one of those old books from his attic. We were kids. Suzanne, Reggie, Tommy G. Franco, and I. Reggie and Franco were the oldest at 14 while the rest of us were all still a year younger. This adventure was the product of a string of snow days after a blizzard. Without school to keep us busy for seven hours a day, our parents bundled us up and turned us loose on the winter world. There was a small tract of woods less than a mile from my house with a clearing you could get to if you knew where to find it. We agreed to meet there each of us bringing a component of the ritual squirreled away somewhere in the multiple layers of our fleece and downy jackets. Suzanne brought a few candles. Reggie got his hands on a knife from his dad's workshop. I brought a can of red spray paint and Franco brought a lighter. Tommy G, the ringleader, brought the sacrifice. His pet snake, Sissy. We gathered in the clearing later that afternoon and Tommy G laid out the plan. 
we spray-painted a ten-foot pentagram in the snow at the center of which sat an old stump. Suzanne put her candles around the base of the stump, and Reggie struggled against the wind to keep them lit. At Tommy G's instructions, we all stood at the five points at the edge of the pentagram while he recited what he called a holy incantation. The ritual was supposed to let us see people's guardian spirits. As the biblical symbol of evil, the snake would allow us to see the otherwise invisible divines around us through its sacrifice. I can't tell you how cold that clearing felt. Sure, it was February, on the tail end of a cold snap that buried our little midwestern town in two feet of snow, but the chill I felt started from the inside and gnawed its way out. I was sweating under all those layers, but my stomach felt like a block of ice. The wind whipped through the leafless trees and blew out one of the candles as Tommy G was finishing the last of the incantation. Maybe that's what went wrong, or maybe it was all a fuck-up from the start. Either way, the five of us marched in unison from the edges of the pentagram to the stump at the center. Tommy G pulled an Aldi's bag from somewhere out of the depths of his coat and sat it atop the stump. I could see the agitated snake writhing inside its plastic sack prison. Reggie handed over the knife and Tommy G cut Sissy free and laid her atop the frozen stump. We must have stood in silence for a solid minute, just stealing nervous glances at one another. Tommy G pinned Sissy's head to the stump. Sissy wriggled uncomfortably against the freezing wood. Finally, Reggie said that Tommy G wouldn't do it and Tommy G responded by taking action. He pressed the knife's edge down behind Sissy's skull and smashed the blade down like he were chopping a carrot. Suzanne yelped. Sissy's decapitated body twisted and rolled itself into knots before falling limp into the snow. A stream of blood leaked down the side of the stump and stained the snow bright red. No one said anything for a while. Then Franco muttered, Fuck, and went to dry heave in the woods. Suzanne sat down and began to cry. Reggie, Tommy G, and I just stood motionless around the stump, staring down at Sissy's head. I is that all? I asked. Yeah, Tommy G said hollowly. That's all. No one mentioned that we weren't seeing any spirits. We fled out of the pentagram and crowded together at the edge of the clearing. That ice block in my stomach had expanded into a certified glacier, and I felt like I would vomit any moment. Reggie took his father's knife back and frantically tried to rub away the blood with snow. I guess after a while, the awkward silence became too much for Franco because he wadded up a snowball in his gloves and chucked it at Reggie's back. That seemed to break the spell because in no time we were all dashing around the edge of the trees, pelting each other with snowballs and ducking away from incoming fire. Eventually, we began to laugh again and pushed the memory of the ritual out of our minds. Kids can do that somehow. A heavy snow started just as the sun was going down. We had wanted to build a snowman but didn't have the time, so we decided we'd all make snow angels in the clearing instead. We spread out in a row so that our angels would line up like chorus dancers. Tommy G lay down, then Franco, and Reggie, then Suzanne, and me at the end. We pushed the imprint of our bundled up bodies into the snow and waved our arms and legs. Just as I was finishing up mine, a surge of fear and coldness rushed through me, made me convulse where I lay. I turned my head to say something, and woven behind the sheet of falling snow that blasted down around us, I saw the faintest outline of a human-like figure glide behind Tommy G. It was there, and then it was gone. It was nothing, really, but it was definitely something. A blur in the background, a slight smudge of the world hushing by just behind Tommy G. Tommy G saw me staring and asked what my deal was. I announced that I might have seen a guardian spirit. Reggie and Franco booed and jeered. None of them wanted to bring up the botched ritual. Tommy G looked like a kicked puppy because he had just remembered that he had killed his only pet. Tears were welling up in Suzanne's eyes again. I told him I was just joking. I didn't mean any harm. Nighttime was creeping over the world, so we all packed up and hiked back home. That was on Friday. The weekend passed by, and none of the five of us saw each other. I woke up on Monday morning feeling surprisingly refreshed. The sun was just rising outside my window. I was nestled into the warmth of my comforter with the gentle drone of the heat moaning in the vents. 
It was 8.30 in the morning and my mom had let me sleep in due to a two-hour delay. When the school bus picked me up, all of my classmates were chatting and running amok. Five days with no school had filled us with rambunctiousness that could not be contained. We joked and laughed and took turns talking about how we wished another blizzard would come and bury the whole school in snow. The bus was so busy and chaotic that none of us even noticed Tommy G wasn't there. In fact, I didn't notice myself until third period when I sat at an empty table in English class. Tommy G sat behind me and we'd usually spend the whole hour passing notes and dirty doodles back and forth. At lunch, I asked Franco and Reggie if they'd seen Tommy G, but no one had. He must have been homesick, the lucky bastard. The day dragged by, but eventually we all got dropped off on the corner and Reggie, Franco, Suzanne and I stood on the sidewalk shivering. We decided we would head over to Tommy G's place to give him a hard time about playing hooky. When we got to his house, the driveway and curb were both packed with cars. We figured his parents were having a party, but we'd stop by if only for a minute. Standing on the slick porch, we rang the doorbell and waited. After a few minutes, an older man we didn't recognize answered and asked what we wanted. His eyes were puffy behind his glasses. We told him we had come by to see Tommy G, and he ushered us into the foyer without a word. Inside, the mood was beyond solemn. People we didn't recognize were milling about and talking in whispers. What's going on? Reggie asked. Well, the man said, then paused to consider his words. He removed his glasses and wiped at his eyes. I don't know if I'm the one that should be telling you this. Telling us what? I asked. The man stared at us for a few seconds, then seemed to accept the burden of delivering bad news. He said, Tommy's family was in a bad car wreck. He cast his eyes into the living room where all of the sad people were roaming about. I... I'm afraid to say... Well... <clears throat> he cleared his throat. I'm sorry to have to say that, uh, Tommy didn't survive. The four of us kids just stood there dumbfounded. We were waiting for something to tell us this was just a cruel joke. We hung in that surreal moment like flies encased in ice cubes. Suzanne's face scrunched up into an awful grimace. Tommy and his family were killed, the man said. How? Franco mumbled. Tommy had a bad head injury, the man said. I stared into the living room at all the people glancing over at us. Just around the corner, I heard someone say, brain hemorrhaging, under their breath. And the person they whispered it to gasped into their hand. How can I put into words how empty we all felt walking down that driveway? We took turns looking at each other with blank faces and then tears began to stream down Suzanne's cheeks. My eyes swelled up as well, and I turned my head to wipe the tears away before they froze in the wind. None of us said a word. None of us could think of anything to say. We just split up and trudged home over the icy sidewalks. When I got to my house, I stopped and turned to gaze into the woods down the street. I couldn't stand going into my house. I knew my parents would see the pained look on my face and start asking questions. If I told them about Tommy G, I would absolutely break down. So before I had to face that, I wanted to return to the clearing. I wanted to stand in the place where I had last spoken to Tommy G, where we had thrown snowballs at each other and laughed and trounced around in the snow. The woods were dead silent. That harsh winter wind tore through the branches and whipped my cheeks beat red. I found Sissy's headless body at the edge of the clearing where Tommy G had thrown it before going home. A light dusting of snow covered its black scales. It was frozen solid. The spray-painted pentagram had faded also, and the candles were toppled over in the drift. On the opposite side of the clearing, our five snow angels remained, but I noticed something strange from a distance. I approached them slowly because in my mind I already knew what I had seen. As I stood over the five snow angels, I began to tremble uncontrollably because there, where Tommy G's head had laid, the snow was stained bright red. Part 2 Reggie took Tommy G's death the hardest. The two had been inseparable. Reggie grew up poor and in a pretty rough household, 
so Tommy G's place was where Reggie went to escape when his parents argued and screamed. He wasn't at school the next few days, and we understand why. That Friday night, we all met up again. Reggie, Franco, Suzanne, and me. Franco had a little clubhouse in his backyard that his father had built for him and his brothers. It was still so cold that we sat for a while in silence, watching our breath hang in the air. I wanted to tell everyone about what I had seen in the clearing. I wanted to say the words brain hemorrhaging like I had overheard at Tommy G's wake and then show them the red snow that stained the head of Tommy G's snow angel. But I thought it was stupid. The red color might have come from anywhere. Maybe it had gotten on the hood of Tommy G's coat after he decapitated the snake and I just hadn't noticed it when we first made the snow angels. I don't remember what we even talked about. We were preteens that had just lost a close friend. How could our young minds express what we were feeling? But I do remember when the night ended. Reggie was headed back to his apartment. The opposite direction is me and Suzanne. Maybe that's why Suzanne decided to tell me, because it was the first convenience of being alone with one of us. I saw something, Susan said out of nowhere. What do you mean? I asked. There was about a half a mile of sidewalk between us and our houses. We would have to pass the forest on the way. In the clubhouse, I saw... She was staring down at her feet as she spoke. She clamped her arms tight to her sides and drove her hands deep into her pockets. Something is all. Well, what was it? I asked. What do you think of the ritual we did, Andrew? She asked. The image of the blood-stained snow angel's head flashed in my mind. I didn't say anything. She asked, Do you think it worked? I remembered then what I had seen in the clearing that Friday, the blur of movement that whisked by behind Tommy G through the wind-driven snow. I wished desperately that that memory was more vivid. Even at the time, I couldn't say I really saw a person. It was just a, well, a hollowness in the air. Yet somehow, I recognized it as a being, something that moved with purpose. When I didn't answer, she asked again. Did the ritual work? Have you seen any spirits? I spat, sharply. I didn't want to tell her what I knew. Suzanne was touchy and prone to crying. I wasn't going to be the person that set her off. Maybe, she said. I, I don't know. I stopped walking and stared at her. After a few steps, she turned and met my eyes. I asked, What do you mean, maybe? Back in the clubhouse, I think I... I... I saw something, she said. What did you see? I asked. She shrank back a bit because I had become suddenly animated. I think between us we knew there was something not right going on. It was nothing she whined, but there were tears starting to form in her eyes and I knew she wanted to say something. I whispered, Suzanne, it was just like a shadow. Well, no, not a shadow. It wasn't dark. It was clear, she said. Where? I pried. Just as we were leaving the clubhouse, you and I were still inside and Franco was heading up to his porch and I saw Reggie going around the side of the house. I saw Reggie going around the side of the house, and it just flew right past him. Like... like steam? Or like a piece of glass? I asked. She was beginning to tremble because she could see that I was nervous. Yeah, like steam. It was just... She saw the sleeve of her jacket across her running nose. She was hollow. She? I asked. A knot had worked its way up my throat. Yeah, it's stupid. I just, I felt like it was a woman, Suzanne said. I went back to the clearing after we found out Tommy G died, I said. Yeah, so? She said. I saw something there, I said. I turned and looked off toward the woods. The sun was beginning to set, and it was too late for us to venture off into the clearing and back before it grew dark. 
I must have been staring too long without saying anything because Suzanne stomped her foot on the icy pavement to get my attention. Tell me, she demanded. I don't want to tell you. I think I should show you, I said. Then show me. It's too late tonight. We can go tomorrow. Meet at my house and I'll take you out to the clearing. Should we tell Reggie and Franco? She asked. They'll think we're nuts, and I don't think we should be bringing up Tommy G around Reggie right now, I said. Just you and I. We met early that Saturday morning, and it had snowed a little overnight, and I was afraid the snow angels would be buried. Suzanne dressed light for the weather in a powder blue sweater and tight jeans. Her brown hair was pulled back in a ponytail, and she had a blue headband that covered her ears and most of her forehead. It dawned on me for the first time that Suzanne was cute. She was the sporty type, not quite a tomboy, but not exactly a girly girl either. I wondered why I had never noticed the faint freckles that spanned the bridge of her nose. The forest was silent as we hiked towards the clearing. The trip took about ten minutes maximum, but I recall that I never heard a single bird or squirrel the whole way there. I heard our heavy breathing with the vapors of our exhalations billowing up into the dead branches. Now and then some snow would crash down on the ground, somewhere in the distance. But all in all, this little tract of woods seemed lifeless. Surprisingly, the clearing looked like it hadn't gotten even a dusting of snow. Sissy's headless body still lay frozen on the edge of the clearing. The blood that ran down the sides of the old stump had darkened to a sick, brown hue, and the spray paint of the pentagram was still visible on the snow. I grabbed Suzanne's wrist and led her across the clearing. There laid our five snow angels all in a row. Tommy G's, then Reggie's, then Franco's, and Suzanne's, and my own at the end. What is that? Suzanne squealed. I had led her to Tommy G's snow angel, and she was staring down where Tommy G's head had laid and it was still dyed bright red. I, I think my breath shivered out between my chapped lips and I glanced over at Suzanne's face. I think it's blood. Oh no, she moaned. She covered her face with her black gloved hands. No, no, no. She took a step away from the snow angel with each utterance of the word. Where did it come from? Whose blood? I don't know, I said. I came here right after we left Tommy G's house on Monday, and it was here. I didn't tell anyone because I didn't bother finishing my sentence. Do you think it has anything to do with... Neither did she. We both turned towards the old stump and Sissy's severed head. That's what I wanted to tell you, about the things you saw yesterday, I said. I sat down in the snow and pulled my legs up against my chest. I saw it, too. You saw it? Yes, well, no, I said. I saw one here, in the clearing. When we were making these, I jerked my head towards the five snow angels. It was snowing really hard and windy, and something just floated by. Suzanne and I were staring into each other's eyes. It was a serious stare, the depths of which were just sussing out between us behind Tommy G. We both mulled it over in our heads for a few minutes. Then Suzanne walked back to Tommy G's snow angel and stared down at the red stain again. Then she began to cry, and she was trying to keep it quiet. So I pretended I didn't notice. An immense emptiness flooded my insides. It was helplessness. I felt like a balloon whose air had all been squeezed out of him by the pressing cold and I was left sagging there atop the snow waiting to fully deflate and be buried by the next blizzard. What the hell is this? Suzanne asked. It snapped me out of my trance and I looked over. She had moved from Tommy G's snow angel and was staring down into Reggie's. I stood up and trudged my way over to her side. I couldn't figure out what I was seeing either. It's... Suzanne got down on one knee and pressed her fingers into Reggie's snow angel. It's ice. She was right. A solid sheet of ice had formed inside Reggie's angel, as if someone had filled the imprint halfway with water and let it freeze overnight. We looked to our left and right, Franco, Suzanne, and my angels were untouched and Tommy G's still had that wicked red stain on its head. 
What, what do you think it is? Suzanne asked. I, I think we better leave, I said. The return trip through the woods was just as eerily silent as the first had been. Now and then, one of us would snap a twig hidden somewhere under the snow, but even the wind was mute as we trekked towards home. Neither of us could think of anything to say. When we got back, Franco was waiting for us on my porch. He was staring at the ground. When he heard us coming, he looked up with an expression that read nothing but pain. It's Reggie, he said. Here's the account of Reggie's death the way I heard it. His parents were out drinking that Friday night and left him home with his two cousins. His cousins were 17 and 16. The winter had given them all cabin fever, and so they decided to roam around Reggie's complex. There's a big man-made lake out behind Reggie's apartment, and it had been frozen over for weeks. They were a band of reckless kids and decided to see if they could walk out to the middle of it. The oldest cousin was up front, then the younger one, and Reggie trailed along a few yards behind. Reggie's cousins are big, not just tall, but heavy too. They must have both had a hundred pounds on Reggie. But it wasn't the largest one who was leading the column towards the center of the lake. It wasn't the younger one who was shuffling along a couple steps behind. It was Reggie, the young one, the skinny one, whose weight broke through the icy surface of the water. His cousins say they heard the loud snap of the shattering surface, but by the time they turned around, Reggie had vanished. Where he stood was a jagged hole clogged with chunks of ice. There wasn't any thrashing or screams for help. Reggie was there, then he was gone. They swept the snow away with their gloves to see if they could spot him struggling down below, but there was nothing in the murky black. The oldest cousin thrust his arm down into the hole, up to the shoulder, and fished all around but there was nothing to pull up. The police brought in a diving team and they plunged down into the hole one after another. When they pulled Reggie up a half an hour later, the skin was completely blue and his arms were frozen stiff around his chest. Part three. Franco was sick to his stomach when Suzanne and I told him about the snow angels, about the brief apparitions that both of us had seen just before Tommy G and Reggie died. He traversed the whole spectrum of emotions, anger that we had kept it secret, unabashed sobbing when the guilt of his taking part in the ritual surfaced, and then terror that his own snow angel laid right next to Reggie's. At that revelation, something in him broke and he began to laugh. We thought he was crying again at first, but then he tossed back his head and guffawed and slapped his knee and sighed in a relieved way. Franco didn't have a death wish. Something had gone wrong in his head, and we should have been more proactive because Suzanne and I both knew it. Franco was the kind of kid that always had things go his way. His parents spoiled the hell out of him. He was handsome and charming and was graced with beautiful blue eyes. He was a teenage heartthrob just a few years short of blooming, and now, suddenly, he was just the next in line. Some time passed, a couple weeks. We were in the first days of March, and while it hadn't snowed much, freezing temperatures kept the grounds covered. We hadn't been back to the clearing since Reggie fell through the ice. I couldn't stomach to see the red stain on the head of Tommy G's snow angel or the two-inch sheet of ice pooled up in Reggie's. What none of us said, though, was the real reason we were avoiding the clearing. No one wanted to see if there was something on Franco's. We just ignored it. The three of us tried to go through the motions at school, but even school had become a grim place. Two students died in the blink of an eye. The teachers carried on as if everything was normal, but their heart wasn't in it. The students still chatted and joked and passed notes, but even our laughter was the guilty, hollow kind. Everyone treated Franco, Suzanne, and I different. We could do no wrong. There were offers of assistance for every mundane task we came across. I caught people's glances in the cafeteria when the three of us sat together, None of us eating much, none of us talking much. Franco was especially quiet. He just sat doodling most of the time and none of the teachers said anything about it. He didn't turn in homework. He half-heartedly scribbled answers on exams. Franco was a different person. There was Franco in the hallway with mismatching shoes. There was Franco in the cafeteria flooding his lunch tray with ranch because he forgot to let off the pump. 
There was Franco sitting in his front yard, jamming a stick into the mud. I felt bad for him. One day I pulled Suzanne aside and told her we had to do something. Sure, we were still pretty messed up about Tommy G and Reggie too, but Franco was facing something we couldn't understand. Maybe we were just making assumptions about the nature of this ritual we botched, but empirical evidence suggested that our punishment was moving in a definite order, and in that order, Franco's death was the next stepping stone. We showed up to his house with a cake. Yes, this was the best that our preteen brainstorming could come up with. Surely, we thought, some fucking sweets would turn things around. His parents ushered us into the house, smiling hard because they worried about what their son had become and were glad to have help from his friends. We found Franco in his room, just sitting there. No music turned on, no magazine in front of him. He conducted himself as if he were in death's waiting room. We circled around him, then joined him on the floor, setting the cake in front of him. Franco just sort of nodded, then returned his gaze to the wall. Franco's parents had given us some paper plates and some plastic forks and Suzanne held the knife out to Franco and asked if he wanted to cut the cake, and at the sight of it Franco lunged like a cat against the wall. He tripped over half of his belongings, scrambling around the room. I shot my hand out to Suzanne and pushed the knife down to the carpet. Franco was nearly hyperventilating. We just stared. It was quiet like that for a minute or two, then all three of us laughed. And we laughed hard. Franco got the best chuckle of us all and cracked jokes at his own expense, pretending to claw his way up the wall making hissing sounds. It seemed like everything was back to normal, but then Franco started talking about some weird thing lemurs did that he read about in National Geographic and he stopped mid-sentence because Suzanne was staring at him with her eyes as wide as headlights and her lower lip quivering, and I looked up where she was looking and saw it. Something between a cloud of vapors and a woman was kneeling behind Franco. There was no face to make out or clothes that I can describe. It was just as if a human had been painted in those squiggly lines you see in the air above hot pavement on a summer day. Franco was asking us what our deal was when the spirit unfurled a pair of wings the width of a truck from behind her back and hugged her ethereal arms around Franco's shoulders. Franco said we were giving him goosebumps all of a sudden. Franco, Suzanne whimpered. It's here. Guardian angels are a legend that says when people are in trouble, divine spirits will intervene on their behalf. It was supposed to be a sign that a person's time hadn't yet come. The ritual with the snake and the pentagram and the candles and the incantations that was supposed to let us see guardian angels. But we were seeing them all wrong. The spirits, these wisps, these mirages, they weren't guarding anybody. They were announcing death. No, worse yet, they were setting death in motion. Would Tommy G have been in that car crash if there was no ritual? Would Reggie have fallen through the ice if no one had lopped off Sissy's head? If we weren't such gullible and reckless children, would Suzanne and I have seen Franco innocently shivering in this evil spirit's embrace? Franco was in bad shape. He was shaking like a leaf in a tree. He was pale. He was fighting back tears, and he kicked the cake across his room, and he took the knife we were using to cut the cake, and he threw it out the window. Franco marched into the bathroom down the hall. From behind the locked door, he gave us instructions. We had to go to the clearing and see what had become of his snow angel. He was just too scared to join us. It was safer if he just locked himself up in the bathroom and did nothing, not a single thing. He was sobbing so hard, we could barely make out the words. Now and then, he would lash out with screaming and cursing and beat his fists against the counters. Suzanne and I left in a hurry, not bothering to tell his parents what was going on. Franco's house was the furthest of all of us from the clearing. I grabbed Suzanne by the elbow, and the two of us jogged our way towards the woods. Twice, Suzanne collapsed mid-step and sat shivering on the pavement. I wiped the tears from her eyes. I told her we didn't have time to cry yet. It took us 15 minutes to get to the entrance of the woods. It took another 10 to find the clearing. And when we did, there lay Franco's snow angel, the third in line. 
and it was a sickening sight. A pile of brackish green bile was freezing in the center of the snow angel. Neither of us could tell what this ugly goop was, but it gave off a putrid chemical smell, and there were little powdery chunks of something mixed in it. I got a stick and churned up the slimy puddle. It was stringy and sticky like mucus. When I disturbed it, the god-awful smell became overpowering. Suzanne and I had to walk away and collapse in the snow to catch our breath. What is it? Suzanne pleaded. What does it mean? I don't know, I yelled. I was furious. Is Franco going to die? Suzanne asked, her voice crackling. I beat my fists into the snow and began to rock back and forth on my knees. A headache pounded inside my skull. I don't know, I said. I grit my teeth and scrunched up my face and groaned, as if terror were a physical wound stinging in my chest. I don't know. What Suzanne and I did know was that we really didn't know anything. In the realest sense of the cliché, we were messing with forces we did not understand. What good did it do for the two of us to come to the clearing? What good would it do to know that Franco's death was imminent when we didn't know how or why or when it was coming? We must have sat there in the clearing for twenty minutes, each of us just silent with our thoughts. After a while, I pulled Suzanne up to her feet. We've got to go tell him, I said. Would you want to be told? Suzanne asked. I don't know. We didn't get a chance either way. By the time we got back to the house, Franco was being loaded into the back of an ambulance. His dad hugged his arms around Franco's wailing mother. She looked up at us with tears running all over her red face, but didn't say anything before they climbed into the ambulance with their son. Turns out, Franco couldn't handle the potential of his own death, and he took matters into his own hands. He was locked up in the bathroom, and shortly after we left for the clearing, Franco just started swallowing down whatever cleaners and solvents and pills he could find in the cabinets. His dad kicked down the door when Franco didn't respond and found him on the floor surrounded in empty bottles of Drano and sleeping pills and toilet bowl cleaner. At the hospital, they pumped his stomach, but it didn't help. He was in a coma for a couple of hours, and then all his organs failed in a hurry. Just like Tommy G and Reggie, he was there one minute, and then he was gone. Suzanne broke down and told her parents everything. Then all hell broke loose in our little town. The local papers printed headlines about five teenagers performing black magic and sacrifice in the woods. The nightly news instructed parents on how to spot signs of Satan worship. I was ostracized at school when I eventually returned to classes. No one sat with me at lunch or spoke to me in the halls. The teachers regarded me like an ugly stain in their classrooms. Suzanne was pulled out of school and sent to live with her grandparents in New England. I never got a chance to say goodbye to her between Franco's death and her departure. I watched from my bedroom window as her family's SUV, packed to the brim with luggage, pulled out of the driveway and sped off to the airport. I was grounded indefinitely, but that was fine, because I had nowhere to go. My friends were all dead. No one in town would acknowledge me. On grocery trips, I would follow at my parents' heels, trying to ignore all the people staring at me from down the aisles. I heard that Suzanne was in therapy, and I was glad, because that meant she was alive and the spirit hadn't checked off the next name on its list. My parents eschewed the need for a psychiatrist and took me straight to a priest instead. He pried for details of the ritual and everything that happened after. He prayed with me for hours. It was funny to me because even after explaining what happened to Tommy G and Reggie and Franco, no one actually believed it was black magic or spirits that had brought about their death. Tommy G and Reggie were victims of accidents, they said, and Franco had killed himself because he was frightened and depressed and didn't know better. Strange that no one actually believed in the ritual's power, but I was still punished as if it were our fault. It was early April by the time I was finally able to leave the house on my own again. Even then, I had to check in with my parents every half hour and provide a detailed itinerary of everything I was up to. Spring was just around the corner, and the snow was melting everywhere that received steady sunlight. I got an email from Suzanne late one night. 
She was coming home to visit her parents for the weekend. She wasn't allowed to see me, but she wanted to sneak out anyway so that we could talk. She said she was doing well and that therapy was helping her cope. She hadn't seen any more spirits. She had spent those first weeks after Franco's passing terrified that her own death was hiding in every shadow, but when it didn't come, her fear began to fade. She seemed optimistic in her email. That made me feel better too. She asked me to go to the clearing again and see if our snow angels had melted. If they were gone, she wrote, then she could finally feel safe. I didn't tell my parents about the email, but Suzanne's parents must have tipped them off because they kept a tight leash on me all that week. Once again, I was confined to the house and my desire to return to that clearing one last time burned like a raging fire in my gut. Finally, the day of Suzanne's flight, I managed to persuade my parents to let me walk to the dollar store. I told them I had a project for school and needed to grab a few craft supplies. I would go straight there and hurry back. I promised, and they agreed. The neighborhood was wet and bleak with only a few piles of dirty snow still lining the streets. As soon as I was out of sight of my house, I headed for the woods. Buds were forming in the branches and the sound of birds and barking squirrels had returned. The ground was black with mud as I walked among the trees. Now and then I stopped to look towards the sky, where, somewhere inside those billowing gray clouds, Suzanne was barreling across the world on a commercial airliner. I smiled. Seeing Suzanne after so long would give me the first inkling of closure that I needed. I was sure of it. In the clearing, the shade of the trees had preserved a patchy blanket of snow. The pentagram had melted away. Sissy's dried up brown blood had faded into the stump. A long tract of snow remained where our snow angels had been made on that terrible Friday, but the snow angels themselves had melted away, and I could only make out a rough outline of them composed of mud and standing water. I stood at the foot of Suzanne's snow angel and stared up at the sky in hopes that I would catch a glimpse of her plane flying by, and I took a deep breath before kneeling down to check the snow angel for any blemishes. There was no blood. No bile, no ice, nothing. I let out a sigh of relief. I closed my eyes tight and smiled. It was over. I opened my eyes, then thump. Like a hammer from the sky, a blackbird plummeted out of thin air and slammed into the ground, right where Suzanne's snow angel had laid. One, late for a meeting. It was a bitterly cold day out there, even by mid-January standards. The jocular voice on the radio informed them that it was currently 26 below with gusting winds and the temperature was predicted to drop to minus 30 after sunset. There was a low visibility alert for across most of southwestern Ontario and, for some inexplicable reason, the guy was giggling madly as he said this. Blowing snow had forced the closure of both the 401 and the 403. The DJ wrapped it up by saying that the OPP were advising folks to stay off the roads if at all possible, then went on to make some lame-ass dad joke about roasting frozen chestnuts over an open fire. <laughs> oh, fucko. We're late as shit, and now the highway's fucking closed. Well, that's pretty funny, isn't it? Fuck you. It was frigidly cold outside, but Jared Brown was sweating freely in the interior of Moe's Honda. Was the goddamn heat cranked up to 11? Or was it just because he was freaking out? He squirmed against his seatbelt and unzipped his jacket. Up in the front passenger seat, Ray was laughing like a retarded spider monkey at the DJ's stupid joke. Jared suddenly realized that he hated Ray. Just a little bit. Hmm. No. That wasn't true. He hated Ray a lot. You fucking idiot! What the fuck are you laughing about? You! Of all people! Jared felt his right hand clench into a fist. His haymaker. Shut up, asshole. We're late. Do you get it? You made us late as shit. Do you understand how bad this is? We were supposed to be on the road over two hours ago. If we'd fucking left on time, we would have avoided the worst of this shit. But now? He was seeing red. Jared clenched his hands together and squeezed. 
and he dearly wished that Ray's scrawny, tattooed little chicken neck was in his grasp. This is very, very fucking bad, Ray. Do you get it? We can't show up fucking hours and hours late. Can not. Do you? I get it. God damn. Fucking chill back there, bro. I thought it was funny, that's all. Ray looked back with offended, bloodshot eyes. His white ball cap was emblazoned across the front with green lettering that read, 420. Jared struggled against the urge to punch that stupid fucking sideways twisted ball cap right off the dumb bastard's skull. Oh, what was funny? Jared asked him. Was it the DJ's stupid joke? Or the fact that we're running over two hours late on a goddamn $50,000 coke deal? Huh? Clarify that shit for me. Which one was it? Beside him, Johnny Delmer calmly said, Hey, Broner, buddy, come on, chill out. You heard what happened. It wasn't completely his fault. And that made Jared even angrier. He glared at Adele's broad, bearded face and gritted his teeth. How is it not completely his fault, Del? The rest of us, you, me, and Mo, we were all ready to go at the appointed time, weren't we? 10 a.m. sharp, and at the appointed place, the Tim Hortons on the north edge of town. None of us were sleeping off the pills in a bug-infested motel beside the airport strip joint, were we? None of us were dead asleep with some random butterface hag of a stripper snoring and drooling away in bed beside us. Fucking were we. No, the rest of us didn't fucking do that. He did. So, how is that not his fault? I would have made it to the Timmy's on time if my fucking car would have started, but it's too cold out. That shit froze up, dog. Ah, that whiny squeak had crept its way into the kid's voice, like it always did when someone was criticizing him for something stupid that he had done. How many times a day was Jared forced to endure that whiny, squeaky, self-righteous tone at work anyway? Dozens. He rubbed his temples and tried desperately to rein in his mounting fury. I can't smash him out, not here and now. Well, I can do that later. Oh, scratch that. I will do that later. After this is all over with, I'm gonna fucking waste that little shit. Jared took a deep breath and said, No, no, you wouldn't have made it out on time, Ray, you stupid mother... Jared gritted his teeth and started again. For fuck's sake. Look, I'll break this down for you, okay? It's real simple. You shouldn't have been out partying last night. You should have known that getting the funk to bed so that you could be ready in the morning was far, far more important than shoving toonies down some Cracker Jack stripper smelly little G-string all night. You should have known this, but you didn't. Ray opened his mouth to protest and Jared barked, No, 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 and no. Shut up. I called you, and called you, and fucking called you this morning, Ray. You wouldn't answer. Now, we're late as fuck. And it's looking like we're going to end up being even later. And it's not because your car wouldn't start, is it? Not really. It's because you went and got wrecked all to fucking back again last night, and you couldn't wake up. So, in conclusion, yeah, you fucking dummy, it is your fault. We will just call them when we get into the city, Mo said, and he changed the station with a stab of his finger. He kept his eyes fixed on the road. We are late, and that sucks, but they'll still get their cash in the end. Fucking highways are closed and shit, right? They will understand. Don't even worry about it. The new radio station flooded the interior of the Honda with pounding, grimy European techno beats, making further argument impossible. Jared sat back and tried to control his breathing. In his mind's eye, he saw the Serb's mirrored shades reflect his own face back at him. They'd been sitting in Luca's Escalade with an envelope full of money laying on the console between them and two large, hard-faced gentlemen lurking in the back seat. Luca had said to him, This is how to go with us, now and always, okay? You will listen now to Luca, 
and you will listen well. When you wish to meet with us, you will call the number that I have provided, and you will leave a message. You will use the code words that I have already provided to you, yes? You are listening to Luca. Ah, good. Someone will call you back within the hour, and they will tell you where and when I wish to meet with you. We will meet at this place. You will give me the exact amount required in an envelope such as this, and I will give you the product in question. Do you understand this thing that I've explained to you? Jared had solemnly nodded yes, and Luca favored him with a gold-plated grin. It is good then. One more thing, though, before we part. This is very important, so I ask you to listen very closely. After you have been given a time and place to meet with us, and you have agreed to these things, and then a problem should arise on your end. Luca abruptly stopped smiling. You must know that your problems are not mine. I have a business to run, and I have concerns of my own. You will come to the agreed place, and the agreed time, when you will not have problems when you get there. It will be very bad for you. Do you understand this thing as well? Jared had looked at his own reflection in those mirrored glasses and saw that he'd understood just fine. He nodded again, and Luca gave him an odd, slanted smirk. One that said, I'd actually kind of like it if you showed up with a problem, my new friend, because I enjoy taking care of problems. Go ahead and fuck with me. You'll find out. Turn that shit down for a second, Jared hollered, and Mo complied with a reluctant sigh. You know what? I think there's something that none of you are really getting here. Luca isn't an old pal that you can have a misunderstanding with and then patch things up over a couple beers while you're watching the game. He's serious shit, and he doesn't fucking know you. This is only the third time we've done business with the man, and the first two times there wasn't anywhere near as much money involved. You don't set something up on the scale with serious people that you don't really know and then fail to fucking show up with the deal, guys. That doesn't happen. He's gonna think that we're fucking him around, and that we got pinched, or even worse. He might think that we fucking got pinched, and now we're cooperating with the cops. Do I have to tell you what that would mean for us? Well, we didn't, and we aren't, so relax. I'm trying to concentrate on the road, guy. Look at this. Mo angrily gestured with a ring-encumbered hand at the blinding sheets of snow that were whipping across the two-lane county road. In some areas, the gale had scrubbed the road bare for long distances. In others, the weathered asphalt was covered in five or six inches of loose snow. This shit is no joke. I don't need you yelling and freaking out back there. It is what it is. Let it go. Well, I'll say this, boys. At the very least, we probably just fucked up a damned good thing. Jared stared out the window at the white, barren fields beyond the glass frigid on all sides by forested gullies, and completely devoid of life. I very well might end up breathing my last breath somewhere just like this, for the days through. Awesome. At the very least, the Serb is gonna cut us off. That last few ounces we turned over, the cash we made, that'll be it for us. Or, maybe it'll be a lot worse. Maybe we won't be making any more money at all. Ever. Mo frowned at him in the rearview mirror and turned the music up. Jared stared out the window and brooded over the lashing, winding ribbons of gale-driven snow. The road conditions were getting progressively worse. Jared was starting to question if they could even make it to Toronto at all. Why the fuck did all of these young Mediterranean guys love driving souped-up little foreign shitboxes so much, anyway? Why couldn't he drive a goddamn Range Rover? Or something like that? I should have come up by myself in my truck. That's what I should have done. Well, I guess I'd still bring Dell with me. He's a brick shithouse, that guy. A lot better backup than the Arabic Bling King and fucking Vanilla Ice up there. If it weren't for the fact that the two younger men were moving most of the blow for them, Jared would have cut them out of the deal after the first transaction. They were reckless and oblivious. A heat score for sure. This went double for Ray. He was an easy bust waiting to happen. Jared had already spent some time in jail. The longest stint was three years. 
the crown attorney's reward to him for knocking off a variety store in the midst of a two-week dope and whores binge in the falls. He'd been young and completely gooned off his face on PCP. The store had been equipped with a CCTV camera, something that he hadn't thought about when he'd slammed through the door with a shotgun in his hand and an upside-down flower pot balanced jauntily on his head. Jail was a bad place. He didn't want to go back. Jared looked at the back of Ray's stupid ball cap and decided that, if they all somehow came out of this mess in one piece, Ray and Mo were officially out of the picture. It might make things awkward down at the warehouse, but... But what the fuck ever, man? Who cares? We'll turn the shit over, and I'll triple my twelve grand easy. Maybe more. I'll quit that shitty job, and then I'll finally be able to kick the living fuck out of this goofy shithead with the saggy pants and fake Gucci belt. I'll do it just to say goodbye. And Mo can either be okay with it, or he can have a taste of what Ray's gonna get too. Eh, what the fuck ever, man. I'm beyond caring at this point. The stark, barren stretch of endless fields on either side of the Honda abruptly ended, and Jared found himself looking out at a thick run of untouched woodlands that crowded the road like a skeletal lynch mob. The relentless wind drove the snow through the trees in hypnotic patterns. Watching it made Jared feel slightly calmer. He needed to be calmer, to take the rest of the journey one step at a time and not think about the near future. One step at a time one minute to the next. That was the only way he was going to get through this. Mo turned the stereo down and looked at Jared in the rearview mirror. Guy, are you going to go for the Fordbin position that came up yesterday? You should go for it. That's what I think. You'd get it, no problem. Everyone listens to you, Guy. You're like a, a leader and shit, you know? Everyone listens when you talk. I wouldn't want that job, that's for sure, Del rumbled. They gotta take the worst of everyone's bullshit. And the area leader takes a shit on them every other day because we're always behind on our orders. But you know what? I think it would be different for you, Browner. I really do. Just like Mo said, you're a natural leader. People respect you. Ray nodded solemnly in agreement. The hurt of Jared's tongue lashing was still visibly stamped on his narrow, peach fuzzed face. Jared turned his eyes back to the window. Even though he hated Ray, was in fact fundamentally enraged by every aspect of Ray's feeble-minded existence, it made him feel bad when Ray looked at him like that. For some inexplicable reason, the kid looked up to him. The wrong reason, probably. Jared's own arms and neck sported a number of crudely executed jail tattoos. He was a man who was used to living under the shadow of the law, and Ray probably thought that was pretty cool. You'd be tossing salad within a week, kid, you fucking idiot. But still, he hated how it made him feel when Ray looked at him like that. Like he just lost his cool and smacked a misbehaving puppy. Or something. It made him feel mean and petty. Well, are you going to go for it? Mo prompted. And Jared realized that they were all waiting for an answer. He closed his eyes tight and massaged his temples again. We're right on the verge of either getting rich, shut down or dead, and these idiots are thinking about a dull little warehouse job. Jesus wept. I don't know, he muttered finally. I don't know if I will or not. Thanks for the vote of confidence though, guys. It was all Jared could force himself to say. Everyone fell silent after that, and the only sounds were the muted roar of the heater, the rumbling crunch of the tires on the road, and the whistling of the lashing wind. The tall, stout tree swayed and bent before its power. Because of the cover that the forest provided, this section of the road was still possible to navigate without slowing to a crawl. But Jared knew that they'd soon be surrounded by gigantic open fields again. Acres and acres of flatland that would act as a runway for the blowing snow. It was only a matter of time before the shiny little Honda started getting stuck. Why now? God damn it. This crap could have held off for another twelve hours, and everything would have been wine and roses. Ten minutes later, their respite came to an end. The woods petered out in the fields, took over the landscape once again. The road virtually disappeared under a blanket of snow, and Mo slowed the fishtailing vehicle to under thirty kilometers an hour. The wind tried its hardest to bully the Honda off the road and into the ditch, 
Visibility dropped to less than 15 meters. Seriously, this is bullshit, guy, Mo erupted. We're not going to make it. None of the roads are like this the rest of the way there. We're going to end up in the ditch. He hesitated, then added, I think we should turn back. Jared erupted right back at him. Are you kidding me, man? Are you? You must be. Do you think that we're going to get another chance at this? Huh? Do you think Luca will just shrug it off and let it go? He told me quite specifically that our problems are not his problems. He told me that not showing up for a deal would be very bad for us. Those are his words that I'm repeating here, not mine. Jared looked hard at each of them in turn. The Serbs were expecting to unload 50 large worth of blow on us today. And if that doesn't happen, they're going to want to ask us why. Dig it? I don't want to have that particular country- Holy shit, look out! It sprang out from the steep ditch on their left like a brown fuzzy rocket and landed on the road less than 10 meters in front of the Honda. The doe. A big one. The doe was already tense to leap out of harm's way, but it was far too close. There wasn't nearly enough time to avoid the collision. Mo screamed, Fuck me! And he simultaneously slammed the brakes and wrenched the steering wheel hard to the right. The Civic immediately began to whip around in a fast little circle, and it spun forward to smash the deer aside with bone-crushing force. The animal's limp body was flung into the opposite ditch, and the Honda kept charging forward spinning like a child's top as it careened from one side of the road to the other. Jared and Delmer walked their heads together. Up front, Ray was shrieking, Y'all goddamn! Over and over in a terror-induced soprano that could have shattered glass, the Civic spun across the right-hand shoulder, whipped out into empty space, then slammed down into the deep ditch with a sound like Armageddon. Ray and Delmer both briskly wrapped their heads off of their respective side windows, and the car shuddered to a halt, and the engine coughed out a great burst of murky steam from beneath the crumpled hood. Then it wheezed to a halt, and died. This podcast is brought to you by the Hulu original series, Hellstrom. Now streaming, only on Hulu. This dark and thrilling show is produced by Marvel Television, and based on characters from Marvel Comics. But Hellstrom is not your typical superhero series. This show is full of suspense, mystery, and horror, with more character-driven storylines. It's the story of two broken children, Damon and Anna Hellstrom, who are the son and daughter of a mysterious and powerful serial killer. Now adults, Hellstrom follows Damon and Anna and their complicated dynamic, as they must come together to save their mother and track down the worst of humanity. Just in time for Halloween, Hellstrom is a scary, mature, action-packed series full of twists and turns you won't see coming. Every family has its demons, but not like the Hellstrom family. And the world isn't ready for a Hellstrom family reunion. Are you? All episodes of Hellstrom are now streaming, only on Hulu. Two, Jared goes for a walk. For long moments, the only sound in the interior of the Honda was the demented howling of the wind. Jared had time to think, well, we're pretty fucked now, aren't we? And then Ray started bawling like a toddler. What the fuck? Tears streamed from his eyes. He cradled the right side of his head and rocked back and forth in his seat. What the fuck was that shit? Ow, my fucking head. Jared turned to Delmer and gasped. Del's window was smeared with blood and spiderweb with a display of deep cracks. Delmer himself was slouched forward against his seatbelt like a rag doll, unmoving. Jared grabbed his meaty shoulder and pulled him upright. Beneath his shaggy cloud of hair, Dell's eyes were half-lidded and rolling senselessly around at their sockets. The right side of his face was slick with blood. His beard was dripping with it. Oh, shit. F fuck, shit. 
Um, goes out cold, and he's bleeding like a stuck pig. Jared hissed. He spied a plastic grocery bag full of cloths wedged beneath the driver's seat, and he pulled a t-shirt out to use as a tourniquet for Dell's gushing skull wound. He wrapped it tightly around the unconscious man's head, and Mo sputtered. Okay. What the fuck? That's a good shirt, bro. Why'd you have to use that instead of... It was the first thing I saw. Who cares anyway, man? It's a shirt. You can get another one. He finished wrapping Dell's cranium and snapped his fingers in front of the burly man's slack, twitching face. Dell? Can you hear me? Delmer? Come on, buddy. That was a good shirt. Mo sulked. In my car. My fucking car! My car is ruined, guy! Uh, I'd say so, Jared replied absently. He briskly slapped Dell's hairy cheeks and yelled his name. Dell sputtered and let out a thick snore. Fuck. He's right out in space somewhere. Jesus! I think he might have broken his skull on the window. Don't you fucking die on us out here, Dell? Don't you dare! That was an Ed Hardy shirt, guy! It was kind of old, but it was still good. And my card is fucked! It was my baby! And now it is totally fucked! Seriously! Mo was babbling. He was in shock. Mo! Hey, Mo! Come on! Get a hold of yourself, man! Ray, shut the hell up! You're fine! Dell isn't. He's unconscious, and his head is fucked right up! We've got some very serious problems here. Why the hell did the stupid deer jump into the road anyway? Mo pounded the steering wheel with his fist. Stupid motherfucker! Aren't they supposed to be hibernating now or something? Don't dick up, dear, don't hibernate! Jared snapped. Listen! We gotta get some help. Delmer's in bad shape. And the car is toast. I'm gonna call 911. And whatever happens after that, happens. Luca will have to wait. No idea was getting chased, dog. Didn't you guys see it? Ray looked back and forth at the other two with eyes that were wide as saucers. Y'all was like a little tornado, you know? I've been seeing that shit the entire ride for reals, man. Little tornadoes out in the fields. You're talking about snow devils. They're not actually tornadoes, Jared muttered, and he pried Dell's eyelids open to have a look at his pupils. Ray was referring to the wintry cousin of the dust devil a small and relatively weak convection current that could lift up light debris from the ground and assume the appearance of a miniature tornado. Jared pulled out his phone and dialed the emergency number. Well, I didn't see any of that myself, but I guess a deer might be spooked by a snow devil. They are not the brightest of critters. Fuck. Nothing. I can't get the call to go through. Somebody else try. Come on, hurry up. It's gonna get cold in here fast. No, no, you don't get what I'm saying, Jared. The tornado motherfucker was chasing the deer across the fucking field. Like, it wasn't just moving around randomly and it was a coincidence that the deer wasn't in his way. It was chasing after the deer on purpose, you know? It was on that bitch! I watched it happen. The deer was running like crazy and fucking tornado thing was right out of his ass! He chased the deer right onto the road and then we started spinning. And I think we hit it. Jared scowled and said, Yeah, I think you're mistaken, but how about we don't worry about that stuff right now and somebody fucking call for help? How about that? Neither Ray or Mo could get the call to go through. Jared couldn't believe it. What is this, 2002? None of us can get any reception. Bullshit. It made no sense. Was the wind somehow interfering with the signal? Was that even possible? Jared didn't know for sure, but it didn't seem likely. He'd never experienced cell phone problems from high winds before, and he'd never heard anyone else complain of such a thing either. He stared at his phone for a moment, scowling, then tucked it away in his jacket. Jared, what are we going to do, guy? Jared looked up from his reverie into Moe's scared, glassy-eyed face and almost yelled, I don't know, you dumb fuck. Why are you even asking me? Instead, he rubbed his temple some more and said, We need help. But our phones aren't working, so I guess the only choice left is to wait for someone to come driving by. And we'll try to flag them down. That's all we got right now. The old-fashioned way. Ray shook his head and snorted. We ain't passed nobody for a long, long time, bro. Ain't nobody out driving today. We all alone out here, dog. For the first time in the six long months that Jared had known Ray, the moron had finally made a concise and valid point about something. 
They were all alone out here. It was a Sunday afternoon, and most people in those parts didn't have anywhere in particular that they had to be on a Sunday afternoon, especially on a Sunday afternoon that is beleaguered by drifting snow and a flesh-freezing windchill factor. The first vehicle that they were likely to see would probably be a snowplow, and on a secondary road like this one, it could be many hours before that happened. Maybe even longer. Jared immediately pushed his thought away. He said, Well, we still need to be making ourselves visible down here, in case some farmer comes putting along in his old Chevy, you know? This ditch is at least eight feet deep. They could cruise right past and not even see us. I keep a couple of safety vests stuffed underneath my seat for work, Mo said. We can tie them to the antenna like flags or some shit, right? Jared reached down and fished the orange web plastic vests from beneath the seat. This is a good idea, man. For real. I'm gonna pop out and put these up on the antenna. Then I want to go have a look at something. Keep an eye on Dell. If he starts to puke, make sure he doesn't choke on it. We well, better not puke, guy! Mo said sternly. Not in my car! No way! What do you want to look at, yo? Ray asked. Jared briefly considered answering him, then didn't. He pulled out his gloves and hat without a word, and jumped out of the car, slamming the door shut as quickly as he could. The sides of the ditch rose steeply on either side, protecting him somewhat from the savage wind that was howling overhead. But it was still cold enough to instantly freeze the mucus inside Jared's nostrils into a painful icy glaze. The Honda was tightly wedged between the walls of the ditch, nose to tail. There was no doubt that it was a write-off. The frame and body were damaged beyond repair, and a gush of leaking engine fluids had melted a grim rainbow of green and dark brown into the snow beneath the front end. Jared nodded the safety vests onto the antenna as fast as his numb fingers would allow, then shoved his hands into his gloves and started trudging back to the spot where they had hit the deer. Jared wanted to find that doe. Despite his open dismissal of Ray's story, he felt like he needed to take a closer look at it. He trudged through shin-deep snow until he found it, the place where the doe had landed after the whirling Honda had whacked the poor beast, like a ball player hitting a homer out into the frozen ditch. There was a wide area of disturbance in the snow where the dying animal had struggled to gain its feet. The wind was rapidly sweeping the area back into a uniform smoothness. If ten more minutes had passed, Jared might have walked right past it. There was a lot of blood. The doe had been gushing the stuff like a waterfall. Jared clambered up the side of the ditch and into the field. Harsh, dirty white pellets of icy snow ripped past his face like a belt sander, making him wince and turtle down into the collar of his heavy winter coat. He took a few steps into the field and a wind gust slammed into his back, staggering him. It was hard to believe that this barren, tortured landscape would, in a few scant months, blossom into a vibrant utopia of green fields and lush woodlands. Jared scanned the crusted snow around him carefully and spotted a trail of shallow, rapidly disappearing depressions. Hoofprints. Traces of crystalline blood speckled the deer's tracks with dots of twinkling crimson. Shivering. Jared followed the deer's trail out into the massive expanse of frozen field that lay before him, a sprawling landscape of white and wind and nothing. He lurched as quickly as he could through the knee-deep snow, determined to follow the prints to their source. He'd gone this far, hadn't he? Fuck the wind and fuck the snow. Just keep moving. He narrowed his eyes against the rasping fury of the air around him and pushed on. A singular moving speck in a massive sea of dirty white. Jarrett had almost lost the trail to the wind entirely and was about to give up when he stumbled into an unusually solid little drift in the snow. Beneath the drift lay the body of the doe, stiff and bulge-eyed and dead. It was rapidly becoming just another contour of the white blanketed field, small and indistinguishable from the dozens of other drifts all around it. Jared spied the splintered end of a branch sticking out of the snow, and he used it to sweep the animal's body clear of its heavy shroud. Holy shit. This didn't happen in the accident. Oh, Jesus. The doe's hide was riddled with large, ghastly bite punctures, and flayed by long, crisscrossing tears 
gaping slashes so deep that they exposed frosted muscle tissue and purple bulges of intestine. The poor animal had been savaged. The collision with the Honda had probably shattered bones and hastened its demise, but the doe had already been near death when it had jumped out onto the road. What sort of predator could have done this? Not coyotes, no way. Not even wolves. They looked like the sort of injuries that a jungle cat would inflict. A toothy carnivore with long, sharp claws. What was it that Ray had said earlier in the car? About how the snow devil had been chasing after the doe? It was on that bitch. That's what he'd said. Jared's toes were getting numb in his boots. He'd been standing out in the open for far too long. He leaned against the wind and shuffled back towards the ditch, cupping his gloves over his exposed mouth and nose to ease the rasp of the whirling snow. He was almost halfway there when he spotted the rabbit. The rabbit was about 50 meters to Jared's right, and closer to the car than he was. It was small, dark brown, and running with the twitchy speed that only a terrified rabbit can muster. A whirling column of white was hot on its heels, a miniature tornado full of thick, roiling sheets of snow. Jared stopped dead in his tracks and watched the rabbit zigzag and run in circles, a brown furry blur of panic. The snow devil followed each movement precisely. It was roughly four feet across and well over twenty feet in height. It was curiously solid looking. In Jared's experience, snow devils were generally wispy, shapeless things, far too weak to pick up enough snow to assume a definitive shape. You could usually see right through them. This one. It looked different somehow, and there was no doubt about it. The snow devil was actively pursuing the rabbit. In fact, the snow devil was gaining on it. Jared's heart started to pound hard in his chest. He whispered, Run, you motherfucker. Run! And broke into a shambling jog himself. The rabbit was on the verge of exhaustion, seeking to cram itself into a hidey hole. The panicked little beast made a desperate scramble for the ditch, and the snow devil swiftly changed course to follow. The rabbit didn't even make it halfway there. The snow devil overtook the squealing creature and snatched it up in the blink of an eye. A moment later, a spray of red and brown erupted out from the top of the devil, a glut of guts and fur that arced right into the air. The ferocious wind seized hold of the crimson gush before it had a chance to rain back down to the ground and scattered it. The devil sputtered forward a short distance further, flickering like the picture of an old worn-out television, then collapsed into a meaningless cloud of red-tinted snow. Jared staggered to a halt again, too stunned to do anything but sway in the wind and gape like a fish at the spot where the snow devil had overtaken, then mulched the rabbit. What? What in the hell just... Move, asshole. Get moving. Now! Jared's legs lurched forward and he fought his way back to the ditch. He slid down the icy slope, and his face was instantly grateful to escape the razor-sharp punishment of the wind. His nose was starting to sting and ache, as were his fingers and toes. Not good. The doe? What the hell happened to the doe? And what the fuck just happened to that fucking rabbit? But that was something to ponder back in the relative safety of the car, wasn't it? Jared hurried back to the Civic, a silvery, ovoid shape ahead that was becoming obscured by a thin blanket of white. He could see Moe's face staring out at him through the window. Jared didn't have the faintest idea what he would say about his foray into the field and what he'd seen there. He was going to sound completely crazy. I won't say anything at all if I don't have to. How's that? The blue sky overhead was heavily smudged by ripping torrents of wind-driven snow. The sun was a dim, weak little disk, hovering at the far side of the heavens, distant and frigid. The afternoon was beginning to wane towards the pitch black of a moonless winter night, and the temperature was plummeting. It seemed likely that this particular country road would remain untraveled until morning came. There was a very real possibility that they would all be spending the frigid night trapped in an unheated car, while something unknown stalked the fields around them, relentlessly searching for hot, 
living me. Something concealed within a twisted column of snow. Something with claws and teeth. Three, claws and teeth. Jesus fucking Christ, Jared shuddered. I almost fucking froze out there. Spending any length of time out there is suicide. The interior of the Honda wasn't exactly warm, but at least it was out of the wind. The windows were frosting over from everyone's breath. Dolmer was snoring thickly beside him with his Ed Hardy adorned skull resting against the shattered window. Dell's eyelids were open slightly showing thin crescents of white. What the hell were you doing out there, guy? Mo demanded. You were gone for a long time. We are freaking out. Yo, I was just about to bust out of this bitch and come looking for you, dog. Swear to God, Ray said. He looked cold and scared. I thought you was in trouble in some shit, yo. Nah, no trouble. Jared rubbed his face and blew into his cuffed hands. I wanted to have a look at the dough we hit, that's all. Tried to track it and couldn't, so I came back. I'll tell you guys what. I'm not going out there again until I see headlights coming, and that's a fact. I don't advise that either of you two go out there. You'll lose your fucking nose to frostbite. Dell's still passed out, yo. Ray's skinny, pallid face was pinched with worry. He needs help, like right now. It's freaking cold in here, man. We needs to be wrapped up in blankets and shit. Jared looked to Mo, and the younger man shook his head. What? I always forget to carry shit like that in the car. We live in Canada, and it's winter, for Christ's sake, why the hell wouldn't you put some fucking blankets in your trunk? I know it is stupid, you don't gotta tell me that. Not everyone's smart like you, maybe. Mo gave him a wounded look in the rearview mirror. Jared exhaled deeply and let it go. He wasn't in much of a position to be holier than thou with anyone. He told the guys a lie, and he fervently hoped that he wouldn't be forced to tell them the truth. If they all stayed inside the Honda, down in the ditch... Out of sight, he thought they might be okay then. That's what he chose to believe anyway. Ray, I'm all in favor of Dell going to the fucking hospital, believe me. But there's nothing we can do about it right now except hunker down and hope. I don't have a clue how far the nearest farmhouse is. Before we went off the road, I hadn't seen one for at least 20 minutes. On a warm spring day, sure, one of us could take a walk down the road and eventually find a door to knock on, but now... You wouldn't make it. You'd go stupid from hypothermia, wander off into the woods, and fucking freeze to death. And that would be that. They wouldn't find you until the next thaw. There's nobody living out here, guy. Not for miles. Mo looked grim. He finally understood the depth of their situation. Help has to come to us. And it will come soon enough, right? The snowplow will come through and we'll get the fuck out of here. <sighs> sure, Jared agreed. One will come around before too long and will be rescued. We just gotta hold on till then. As for Luca, I don't know what to do about that situation. Or what he is going to do about it. I guess we just won't worry about that right now. We've got more pressing concern at the moment. Yeah, like the fact that a guy took a piss and it's fucking freezing out there. Ray muttered. Jared stared at him for a moment, then firmly shook his head no. Oh man, you'll get frostbite on your dick. For real. I've got an empty water bottle back here. Why don't you just piss in that? We won't look. Fuck that! Mo growled. I don't want her to piss in my car. That shit is out of line. He's not gonna piss in your car, Mo. He's gonna piss in the bottle. Relax. Jared gave the bottle to Ray and Mo snatched it out of his hand. No! Don't you dare web out your cock in my car, guy. Fucking seriously. Yo, what's with all the hating, dog? Ray scowled at him. I ain't gonna spill any for reals. I've done this before. And don't snatch shit out of my hands, bitch. That shit is just plain rude. Oh, 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 well, how, how is this? You call me a bitch in my own car again, and I will knock you the fuck out. Seriously, guy. I'll wreck you. Whatever, you fucking beaner. Hey! What the fuck, guys? Stop this stupid shit right fucking now! You're such a stupid little wigger bitch that you can't even rip on the right fucking race! I am Arab, not Mexican dumbass! Mo is short for Mohammed! Maybe you should try to learn something about the rest of the world, asshole. Okay, so you're a terrorist then. Right on, bro. Good for you. That's way better. 
Moe's lips thinned into a hard little line and Jared put a firm hand on his shoulder. No. Come on, stop this. Everyone is stressed the fuck out. This is the stress talking, guys, not you. No, Ray sputtered, his face red. It ain't no stress talking. This camel jockey motherfucker right here running his mouth when he can't back it up. Open your mouth one more time and I will knock your teeth out, guy. You could go get yourself a grill then, right? That would be pretty cool. Mo, shut up. Stop it. Ray, shut up too. Mo turned his narrowed eyes onto Jared, ready to lash out, and Jared stared right back at him. Tell you what, if you guys want to scrap, go ahead. Step outside and give her. And when you're done, I'll step outside too, and I'll take on the winner. Jared nodded solemnly. And after I kick the living shit out of him, I'm going to give the loser some too, just to keep it fair. How's that sound? Mo opened his mouth, thought the better of it, and shut it again. Ray looked down at his saggy, panted lap and didn't utter a peep. Okay then. Ray, take a piss outside. I guess. If it's gonna keep the peace. Stay down here in the ditch though, man. For real. Do not go up into the field or whatever. It's cold as fuck up there. You're out of the wind down here. You're not gonna go very fucking far, dog. Don't worry. Ray cast a dark look at Moe and added, I think I'll take a piss right here beside this cheap little shitbox, bro. Maybe even on it. Ray jumped out into a blast of cold air and slammed his door shut behind him. Mo watched him go with naked hatred in his eyes. I can't stand that piece of shit guy. I just want to bust his fucking face in. This was all his fault in the first place. You are right. Jared nodded. Yep, I was. He's a fucking idiot. But he moves a lot of weight too, Mo. You gotta take that into consideration. We still need him. He looked away and thought, none of it's going to matter anymore pretty soon. Either the cold is going to kill us, Luca is going to kill us, or whatever's cruising around the field is going to fucking kill us. Beside him, Dell abruptly let out a thick, phlegmy snort and mumbled, Ice is in the whirlwind. Eyes like wind is claws and teeth. Jared gaped at him and the fine hairs in the back of his neck stood up like stiff little quills. What the fuck? Dell's head was still craned to rest against his shattered window. His eyes were fully open, but only the bloodshot whites were showing. Dell was drooling heavily into his beard, staring out the window with those sightless eyes at nothing at all. Nothing that Jared could see, anyway. What did you say, Dell? Mo was twisted in his seat with his back against the dashboard, cowering as far away from Johnny Delmer as he could. Jared, what's he talking about, guy? Is he actually awake? I'm talking about death, Del burbled. Spit bubbles inflated and popped as he spoke. I'm talking about predators and prey. <laughs> Guess which one you are. Del got fucking scared in me, guy. Stop it. Mo pleaded. He looked at Jared and stabbed a finger in Dell's direction. Seriously, he's freaking me out. What is he talking about? Um, Dell? Jared said carefully. Is, is, is it? Is it you who we're talking to now? Dell's response was to grin widely and fart. His breathing was shallow. It rattled in his chest like a venomous snake. Who am I talking to? Jared whispered. Who are you? I'm screaming in the dark. Del gurgled. His eyelids fluttered. There are faces in the whirlwind, Jared. Claws and teeth in the snow. Ask Gray. He'll know all about it. Soon enough. He's climbing up the slope right now. Do you see him? Jared twisted in his seat just in time to see Ray's scrambling feet disappear up the side of the ditch. Oh, fuck, Ray! Jared, what the fuck is this? Mo's eyes were wide and wet. We're all going to die tonight. 
Dale whispered. We're all going to die. And then we'll scream. We'll scream with the others in the wind. Shut up! Mo shrieked. He looked back to Jared and pleaded. Make him shut the fuck up! He's freaking me out and I don't want to be here anymore! I have to get Ray back in here, man, okay? Just ignore anything he says and fucking get a hold of yourself, alright? Just hang tight for a minute. Don't leave me here with this creepy fucker, please, guy! Mo reached out to snare a panicked fistful of Jared's coat. Jared snarled and slapped the hand aside with a blurred snap of his wrist. He seized the younger man by the base of his skull and squeezed. Mo whimpered and clutched weakly at Jared's wrist. Jared squeezed harder. Fuck off and get a grip on yourself right fucking now. Don't be a punk. Quit panicking and keep your shit together. Got it. He tightened his hard, calloused grip on Moe's skull once more, for emphasis, then released him. Stay here and calm the fuck down. I'll be right back. There wasn't time to be any nicer about it, as much as Jared didn't like Ray. Well, there was the rabbit. Ray was a fuck up and Ray needed an ass kicking for sure, but but he didn't deserve what was waiting for him in the field. That was too much. Jared jumped out of the car and bounded up the steep slope of the ditch in four great scrambling leaps. At the top, the wind was waiting for him, breathtakingly cold and savage as a headhunter. Jared's exposed skin immediately began to tingle and smart against the abrasive atmosphere around him. His sinuses ached. Ray's oversized camo print jacket was a small green and brown smudge in the distance. He was wandering out into the middle of the field, shambling through the deep snow like a man in the grip of a dream. Jared plowed along after him. His breathing quickly became labored and harsh. It had been two years since he'd last smoked a cigarette, but it seemed that the long-term damage had already been done. Jesus. I really hope I won't have to run for it because I'm fucking wiped. I'm not a young buck anymore, no, sir. Ray suddenly stopped dead and stood there in the knee-high snow, his arms dangling at his sides and his body rocking back and forth like a sapling in the roaring gale. Jared plodded up with burning lungs and shook him by his shoulders. Ray, what the fuck are you doing, man? Why the hell did you come out here? Ray turned to face him and his eyes were dark and huge, the eyes of someone who had been heavily drugged. He slurred. I was taking a piss and then I thought it would be nice to come out here and say like, Hi, no? Someone told me I should come, come say hi. Ray trailed off. The slack hypnotized expression abruptly disappeared and was replaced by a look of confusion. I... I... I don't, I don't know why, why I came out here, dog. It's fucking cold and shit out here! Ray looked around them wildly. I... I can't even remember coming out here. I, I can't... I... I don't... I, I don't even... Aw, oh, man, fuck this! Ray brushed past him and started trudging back to the car. Jared followed close behind. The ditch seemed very, very far away. Something grabbed the dumb bastard by a slow-witted brain and walked him out here, just like a puppet. They needed to get back to the car, and fast. Ray, I, I think we'd better hurry up, bud. Let's pick up the... P oh, shit. Look, it's one of those fucking tornado things! Jared wheeled around and saw that a towering dervish was bearing in on them from across the field, moving like a speeding freight train along the shifting landscape beneath it. The devil was as tall as a telephone pole, and well over eight feet across, a mammoth disturbance of snow and wind, and something else, something malevolent. Ray, Ray, go! Run your ass off! Go! Jared shoved Ray ahead of him and they all outran for the ditch. Jared's lungs immediately began to burn. His legs went rubbery. His boots felt like they were made of lead. He shouted, Don't stop! And don't look back! And then, 
there was only the screaming wind, the crunch of boots on snow, and harsh panting of white frosted breath. The ground was frigid quicksand that sucked at the fleeing men's feet, and the gale constantly pushed them back with a thousand icy hands. It seized hold of Ray's hat and sent it spiraling up into the sky. Jared's throat convulsed on a strangled scream. They weren't going to make it. There was simply no way they were going to make it to the ditch. It's right fucking behind us! He could actually hear the thing. Its roar mimicked the high-pitched shriek of the blasting wind, but it was really the triumphant howl of a carnivore, a ravenous beast that is moments away from leaping upon its kill. Jared tried to put on a burst of speed, but he had nothing left. Beside him, Ray looked over his shoulder at the thing that loomed behind them, and his face clenched into a rictus of horror. Jared kept running. He heard Ray scream, Jared! Come help me! And then there was an indescribable tearing sound. Unbidden, Jared's brain spat up the image of a wet blanket falling into the whirring blades of a gigantic fan. Jared pumped his leaden feet and kept his gaze fixed on the approaching ditch. He did not look back. Tears froze on his cheeks. He didn't dare look back. Not like Ray did. He didn't want to see what... Faces in the whirlwind. Eyes like windows. Claws and teeth. Ray had seen. No. No and no again. Jared staggered the last few ungainly steps to the ditch and hurled himself face first down the slope. He tumbled like a hoop to the bottom and landed on his back wheezing and trembling. He tried to get up but couldn't. His limbs were dead and his lungs were on fire. There was no more to give. He was done. Heart frozen in his chest, Jared curled into a tight little ball and he waited for the devil to fall into the ditch and tear him apart. A minute went by, then two, and then five more. Grimacing against the stiffening in his legs, Jared heaved himself to his feet and cautiously crawled up the slope until he could see out into the field. The snow devil was gone, but it had left something behind. A giant splotch of red streaked snow. He's with them now. He's in the wind. Jared slid back down to the bottom of the ditch and, numb right down to his soul, he limped back to the car. Out in the field, the wind rapidly covered Ray's sparse remains in a thick, shifting shroud of white. Within minutes, every trace of him was buried and gone. 4. Catch You, Eat You Where's Shay? Jared didn't answer him. Not right away. He was staring at Johnny Delmer. Dell's head was once again resting against the window. He looked like he was taking a nap on a long car ride to hell. His eyelids were closed now, and his face was slack and still. Dell's beard was cemented with a slushy mixture of freezing blood and drool. He looks like a prop from the set of a horror movie, Jared said. Jesus. Did he... Say anything else while I was gone? Yeah, he did. And it bummed me out, guy. As soon as you left, he turns to me and says, You'll be next, little rabbit. And then he just kind of slumped over and stopped talking. Next for what? Why'd he call me a fucking rabbit? Jared shrugged. Don't worry about it right now, man. We've got... What happened today? Why isn't he with you? Mo's eyes were wide, frightened and glistening. Something bad happened. I can see it in your face. Tell me what happened. That's what I'm trying to do for fuck's sake. Be quiet for a second. Jared kept staring at Delmer's inert bulk. His face was deathly pale, save for twin blotches of high, hectic red on his stubbled cheeks. Mo, listen to me. 
There's something out there, man. Out in the fields. Remember what Ray said earlier? About how he saw a snow devil chase that deer out onto the road? The deer? You did find it, didn't you? Mel's voice was very small. You lied about it. Yeah. I did. I thought it was for the best at the time. I found the dough and it was mangled all to shit and back again. Like something completely savaged that fucker. Mel crossed his arms to suppress a shiver. That didn't happen when he hit it. Jared shook his head. His eyes didn't waver from Dell's face. Not for a moment. Nope. Not a chance. The doe spooked me pretty bad, but then I saw one of those things go after a rabbit. It caught him. What was left of it got blown away by the wind. Mo's mouth turned down into a small, frightened little crescent. Get the fuck out, he whispered. I didn't tell you guys because I wanted to wait until I had to. The situation was shitty enough already without that particular fact being out in the air. Mo nodded slowly, his eyes large and dark. Sometimes, not knowing is better. I get that. Did, uh, when Ray went out there into the field, did, did he... Jared swallowed hard and said, When I went back out into the field to find him, Ray was just standing there, swaying in the wind. He looked like a sleepwalker. He said that a voice in his head told him he should come out and say hi. He didn't even remember going out there. We were on our way back and one of those... things. The snow devil. It came out of nowhere and chased us. We ran like hell, but it was too fast. It was right on top of us. And Ray looked back at it, even though I told him not to. He looked back, and what he saw made him trip over his own feet. I... I didn't stop to help him. I kept running. Mo scrubbed his hands over his face, let out a quavering little sigh. He's dead. Jared was studying Johnny Delmer again, his expression sharp and watchful. He nodded. Yeah, yeah, he's dead. He's... There was nothing left of him but a lot of blood in the snow and a few scraps of his jacket in the wind. Faces in the whirlwind, Mo breathed. That is what Del said, isn't it? Something about eyes, too. And teeth. His lips were trembling. I can't handle this shit, Jared. This is too fucking scary for me, guy. I've got a... I've got a nervous condition. I... I, I, I can't handle scary shit like this. You have to try and stay calm, man. Panicking and freaking out isn't going to help us. Clear thinking might. And I'll tell you what I think. I think that these things are trapped in the fields. <clears throat> it seems like they can't cross the ditch. Jared coughed and winced. His throat was raw from inhaling the icy blasts of gritty snow that shrieked and gibbered endlessly just outside their frail fiberglass shelter. That dough was ripped up pretty bad. But I've seen what these things can do, and there shouldn't have been anything left to jump out onto the road in the first place. I think it just barely grazed the doe as she was jumping to clear the ditch, just for a split second, just long enough to slice her up. If it was able to cross the ditch and follow her, it would have. I'm sure of it. What makes you so sure, guy? Mo was starting to slide towards panic again. What? Did you stop to ask it or something? Was that before or after it chewed up Ray and spat him out? Huh? How the fuck do you know for sure? Because if they could, they would have gotten us by now. But they haven't. How am I supposed to keep calm if you're going to keep saying shit like that? Mo hissed. He flapped a hand at Dell. And then there's this fucking guy here saying weird stuff like, You'll be next and little rabbit and fucked up shit like that. Seriously, what the hell is that supposed to mean? I'm... I'm next for what? Next to die? Fuck you, Delmer! Well, Jared said slowly, 
If that's what he meant, he was wrong. You aren't the next in line. Dell was. I've been watching him for a few minutes now, and he hasn't moved or drawn breath even once. He's starting to turn blue. Jared hesitated, then added, I'm pretty sure he's dead. Oh, fuck me. No closed his eyes tightly. I mean, sitting in here with a dead body? Uh, not for much longer. We're gonna jump out real quick and pull him out of here before he gets frozen into a sitting position. I'm not touching him. No way. No, that's too much. Mo shook his head violently. Not gonna do it. Yeah, you will. This fucker's got to weigh at least 240. Probably more. I'll have a hell of a time trying to do it myself. It'll be quicker and easier with the two of us. I don't want to touch a dead body. Seriously, guy, no. That's fucking gross. Seriously, guy? Yes, you will. Jared's cold terror was beginning to heat and boil up into anger. He could see that Mo was showing his true colors, as people always do when the chips are down. For all of his bluster and pomp, Mo was, in all actuality, something of a crybaby bitch. Jared's patience was at an all-time low, and he'd never been known for his patience. I don't want to have to say this again, bud. You're going to get the fuck out of the car, just like a big boy would, and you're going to help me drag this dead, burly son of a bitch the fuck out of here. Now, before you speak, remember, I'm not going to be happy if I have to repeat what I just said. Mo was crying. He was trying his best not to, but he was. Okay, okay, just don't get mad at me, guy. Don't, please. I'm shitting bricks over here. This is too fucking scary for me. I, I have a nervous condition. I, I can't deal. He's telling you the truth, you know. He's very, very afraid. We can smell it. And the wind. Dell rasped, and Jared flinched back against the door hard enough to wrap his head. Dell started to grin. His eyelids flew open, and his eyes looked like frosted over marbles. He sat upright and turned his head to the left, pinning Jared to the door with a gaze that was horribly flat, horribly dead. Every movement Johnny Delmer made was accompanied by a brittle crackling sound, the sound of frozen tissue being made to flex and bend. Mo screamed and slid off his seat. He cowered beneath the steering wheel with his face in his hands. We could smell that you little rabbits were down here, hiding in your hidey hole. We could smell your fear. Your sweat. And your blood. Del grinned even wider. Blood. Sweat. And fear. So sweet. It pained us that you were out of our reach. It was intolerable. Del's words generated no vapor. His breath was as cold as the winter air itself. Kick it! Kick it in the face! Mo shrieked, and the piercing note of hysteria broke Jared's paralysis. He rocked back and drove the heel of his boot at the dead thing's nose. Dell caught it easily. His grip was impossibly strong. Jared lashed out wildly with his other foot, and Dell snatched it out of the air without even flinching. He clamped both of Jared's legs under his arm and reached for the door handle with his free hand. Jared wailed and sat up to batter Dell's face with desperate fists. Dell's nose broke, teeth shattered. Dell grinned jaggedly and popped the door open. Now, there is a way, Dell crooned. His voice was the chattering of dead leaves on winter branches. Now, we have a vessel. The horror that wore Dell's body like a costume let out a dry, rusty cackle and started dragging Jared out of the car. He screamed and seized hold of the driver's seat with hands like claws. The Dell thing gave his legs a tremendous yank, and his body was jerked halfway out of the car. 
Frigid air slid up the back of Jared's rucked-up coat and mauled his skin. He scrabbled for purchase like a cat with clumsy, gloved hands and screamed, Mo, God damn it, help me! Get out here and tackle that fucker! Slow him down! Do something! Bell's corpse gave his legs another tremendous yank, and Jared's face hit the ground. He fought to roll over and couldn't. Jared flailed and screamed, choking on mouthfuls of dirty snow and road salt. He felt himself being pulled up the slope of the ditch and flailed his arms like a madman. No, 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 no! There was a sudden commotion above him. Dell's unbreakable grip on his legs relaxed for a moment, and Jared spastically kicked his way free. He somersaulted down the slope and landed on his ass. A split second later, Dell and Moe came tumbling down after him. Their rolling bodies crashed into Jared's back, and there was a brief confusion of kicking legs and pumping fists. Mo tried to clock the Dell thing in the jaw and whapped Jared on the nose instead. Jared flopped flat onto his back with his nose spurting and stars exploding behind his eyes. He windmill kicked his legs blindly in the direction of the melee until he could see again. Jared sat up and, through the prism of involuntary tears in his eyes, he saw that Dell had Mo pinned down and had his dead blue hands clamped around Moe's throat. Moe's heels were stomping deep indents into the snow, a frantic drumbeat of oxygen deprivation. Jared scrambled to his feet and pulled a double-edged hunting knife from his coat, his discreet insurance against unexpected trouble during their meeting with Luca. A wordless howl on his lips, Jared flung himself on Delmer's back and stuck the eight-inch blade into his neck, all the way to the hilt. Dell twisted around to grab him and Jared wrenched the knife in the opposite direction. Razor sharp steel sliced through freezing flesh like it was butter, and Dell's neck opened up like an obscene flower in bloom. Jared roared up to the sky and yanked the blade the other direction. The sharp edge pushed between two vertebrae, and, like magic, Dell's hairy cranium was suddenly hanging against his chest by a few strings of meat and skin. The Delmer thing jabbed backward with an icy elbow and knocked Jared sprawling. Agony flared in his side, and he writhed like a squashed spider in the snow. Dell tottered to his feet and, Mo temporarily forgotten, he advanced on Jared with blindly grasping hands, severed head swaying in front of his chest like the ghastly pendulum in Satan's grandfather clock. Mo sat up and was wrenched by a coughing fit. He was covered in snow and his face was a dull shade of brick red. Mo, he's still coming. Help me get him down. Jared forced himself to stand and met the staggering horror's advance with a savage kick to the outside of its knee. Dell's legs snapped into a crooked line, and he toppled slowly, as if his windmilling arms were somehow keeping him buoyant in the air. The momentum of his falling bulk swung his dangling head around in a vicious arc, it ripped free from its gristled moorings and went flying in the opposite direction. One of the windmilling hands snagged Jared's coat, and he was dragged down to the ground. They landed in a heap, and Jared's broken rib thrust a long spear of pain into his side, hot and savage. He yelled, Let go of me, cocksucker! and stuck his blade repeatedly into the headless thing's chest and abdomen. It was like stabbing a frozen side of beef. Mo, what the fuck are you waiting for, man? Help me! Mo had a look of pure, dumbfounded terror on his face. He attempted to get up off his ass, failed, then proceeded to throw a series of loosely packed snowballs at the combatants, keening and sobbing like a child as he did so. Jared panted, For fuck's sake, man, get over here and help me! and then hands like blocks of frosted iron clamped onto either side of his head and squeezed. Jared wailed. The pressure was immediate and unbearable. He pulled the blade out of Dell's chest and stabbed impotently at the monstrosity's arms. He could hear the low, groaning screech of his own skull creaking between the thing's massive palms like the beams of an old house. Suddenly, Mo came streaking in from above and landed on them both with his knees. 
much like a professional wrestler diving onto his opponent from the top of the turnbuckle. The trio was briefly embroiled in another cartoonish confusion of flailing limbs and clouds of snow, which ended with Moe sitting on Delmer's back and Jared laying across his legs. Del's reanimated corpse was incredibly powerful. Moe and Jared succeeded in pinning it down for a whole two seconds before it heaved and flung them through the air like toys. It managed to lurch to its feet, but its broken leg gave away entirely at the first step, so it began to crawl instead. Jared and Moe circled away and watched as their former friend and co-worker wormed through the snow with blindly searching hands. Seeking out a living body to present as an offering for the puppet masters above. The devils that dwelled in the wind and snow. He's still moving around, Mo said. His voice was a squeak. Guy, seriously, he doesn't even have a fucking head and he's still moving. He's still fucking moving around, Guy. What the fucking shit? Mo, stop looking at it. Jared commanded, and look at me instead. No, don't look at it, just look over at me and listen. Jared studied Mo frankly for a long moment, his expression appraising and blunt. He paused to wipe a freezing slush of blood from the lower half of his face with his sleeve and said, We can't stay down here in the car anymore. That thing will just rip off the doors and drag us out. We have to leave. We have to cross the road and get into that gully on the other side of the field. I think that the devils are fenced in by the ditches and woods that border their territory. I don't think that they can leave the fields. If we run across that field and make it to the gully, we can cross it and get over to the next major road. It's right on the other side of that gully. I know it is. We'll never make it, Mo said. He was shivering. They're too fast. They'll catch us. Even if they don't, Guy will freeze to death. I'm already freezing! Jared pointed at the obscene thing that was hunting for them on its belly, like a bloated carnivorous worm, and he snarled. This bastard here is the motherfucking Energizer Bunny. It'll never give up. Not until we're both dead. If you want to stay here, you're going to have to cut it into pieces. Get it? Take its arms and legs off. Jared shook his head and circled away. Nell was crawling too close for comfort. If you want to try, I'll lend you my knife and my best wishes, because I'm not going anywhere near that piece of shit. <coughs> that motherfucker broke my rib, and he almost crushed my skull. The crawling thing sensed Jared's presence, and it wriggled towards him with eerie speed. He jumped away and said, See that? This fucker doesn't quit. Making a run for the county road is probably our only chance, and I am taking it. I'm not going out there. Are you crazy? Mo squealed, and he backpedaled from Delmer's clutches. We can walk down the road, guy. You said they can't cross the ditch onto the road, right? We'll just take the road back the way we came. And die of exposure, Jared finished. We've already been through this. There's nothing for miles back there. Just woods and fields and certain fucking death. Listen, man. You've only got two choices here. You can come with me and maybe live. Or, Jared pointed at Dell. Or you can stay here with him. Mo's face was miserable and afraid. I'm scared, he whispered. The wind stole his words. I'll take that as a yes. Jared turned to the car and muttered. Wait a sec. I gotta grab something first. He nodded towards Dell. Watch out for that cocksucker. Jared dug around the back seat and pocketed what he was looking for. He turned back to find that Mo was now standing halfway up the slope of the ditch. The monstrosity was snatching at the trampled snow where Mo had just been standing. Jared put up his hood and clambered up the slope to join him. Mo looked like he was ready to fall into pieces. We aren't gonna make it. His words were much like his voice, small and weak. Jared barked. Stop saying shit like that, would ya? And winced. Beneath the hum of his pumping adrenaline, his broken rib was screaming. His nose ached and throbbed. It was full of frozen blood. Of course we'll make it. Once we cross the other ditch, just put your head down and run, man. Don't stop. What are these things, guy? 
Mo clutched at Jared's sleeve and looked at him with pleading eyes. Why are they after us? Because we're warm and alive. And they're cold and dead, Jared thought, and said, How should I know? I don't fucking know any more than you do. All I have is a guess, same as you, and we don't have time to be playing guessing games. I'm cold, the light's fading, and that gruesome motherfucker is gonna crawl up here to grab us in a minute or two. So get fucking moving, now! Jared gave him a shove and Mo got moving. Jared started after him, then spied something that stopped him dead in his tracks. It was Del's hand. It was planted deeply into the snow just a few feet away. Del's head was slowly being covered by the shifting snow. His eyes were icy white spheres, and his lips were purple. They were moving. He was saying something. Jared wasn't a lip reader, but he was pretty sure that Johnny Delmer's decapitated head was mouthing the words, Catch you. Eat you. Over and over again. He scooped up a big double glove full of snow and hurled it into the thing's face. The movement of its lips dislodged the snow, and the hateful litany continued. Catch you. Eat you. Catch you. Eat you. Fuck you! Jared growled. Eat shit! How's that? He hawked a greenish wad of phlegm into its face, then turned his back and clambered up the slope. Overhead, the pale slip of a sun was sliding quickly towards the tree line, where it would be extinguished in cold and shadow. Nightfall was coming. Five. Winter is hungry. Standing on the road was almost like standing on the surface of a frozen, hostile alien planet. The road was buried in ten inches of snow as far as the eye could see, which wasn't very far. The shrieking air carried a million icy, whirling little daggers. They immediately strafed Jarrett's face into numbness and made his lashes freeze together from the watering of his eyes. Mo was standing with his back against the onslaught, arms wrapped around him and knees bent to brace against the bullying wind. He shouted, Guy, this is unreal! We're going to fucking freeze to death out here! We'll be okay when we get to the gully! Jared hollered back. We'll be out of this bastard of a wind! We can build a fire! He studied the field that lay on the other side of the ditch. At this point, it was impossible to see how far the tree line was from the road. It was too distant, lost in the blowing snow. 400 meters? Five? How far could he run? with a broken rib anyway. I hope that I don't have to do it, Mo. It was best not to think about that, not unless he had to. Jared gripped Mo's shoulder and said, We can do this, bud. We can make it. When we get into the field, put your head down and run. And keep fucking running. Don't look around. Just fucking run. Okay? You ready? Mo shook his head no, miserably. Jared started for the opposite ditch and pulled Mo along behind him. They skidded on their heels to the bottom. This ditch was much shallower than the other. Jared could easily look out into the field while standing at the bottom. It was a bleak, dim hellscape of massive winds and desolate spaces. A man could wander out into that howling void and never be seen again, Jared thought. How many abandoned vehicles have they found in the ditches out here over the years? How many deer hunters and hitchhikers have gone missing, never to be seen again? Winter is hungry. Jared understood that now. Winter will devour you, whole and screaming, and leave no trace of you behind. Jared! Mo pointed behind them. Jared turned to see that Delmer was laboriously heaving himself across the road on his hands and one knee dragging his broken leg behind him. His neck hole gaped at them like an eye. Jared croaked, Come on, let's go! And he scrabbled up the short icy slope into the full wrath of the wind. It ripped the breath from his lungs and raked his face raw. Overhead, the sky was fading to violet with the setting of the sun. Night was almost upon them. 
Jared could hear Mo struggling close behind, already gasping from a sedentary life of drinking beer and riding around all day on a forklift. Jared's rib was screaming with every jarring step he took. He gritted his teeth and kept his eyes focused in the general direction of the tree line that lay somewhere ahead. They were lost in the shrieking void of winter's fury. It would be dangerously easy to run in a large circle and end up back at the road. Don't run in a circle, you dumb shit! Don't you fucking dare! Keep steering a bit to the right! Mo was starting to make pathetic, mewling noises of exhaustion. He was slowing them down. You fat fuck, I am older than you and I've got a broken rib! Jared suddenly hated him intensely, passionately. He probably always had. The hatred made him feel better about this decision. I can't see anything, Mo screamed at him. We'll die out here whether they get us or not! My face is freezing! Shut up and keep going, you fucking idiot! Jared roared. Save your breath! Jared wasn't about to let Mo turn back. Hell no. He was needed. Mo was an integral part of the new plan. The envelope that Jared had taken from the car before they left was slapping a painful beat against his injured side, taut and feverish. It contained $50,000. Their combined investment on today's aborted deal. They'd all been co-workers and business partners, yes, but two of those partners were no longer in the picture. What was left of Ray had been scattered by the wind. And as for Johnny Delmer, well, he wasn't going to be showing up for work on Monday either, was he? Dell had been reborn, and in his new life he had a horrible new calling. He was now a caretaker of the fields, a servant of the things that dwell in the shrieking winter winds. Dell was lost. Maybe they won't come for us, Jared thought wildly. Maybe they've had enough. Maybe they've had their fill and they'll just leave us alone. Jared! Mo shrieked, and the raw terror in his voice made Jared stumble. Mo ran into him and clutched his arm in a death grip. It's coming. Run, guy. Run like fuck! The devil was a monolithic vortex. The biggest yet. A twisting worm that housed unspeakable horrors. Jared's guts turned to water. There would be no choice then. But $25,000 wasn't enough to start a new life anyway, was it? Not really. Fifty. Fifty was the magic number. Jared's hand darted into his pocket. He pulled out his knife. I'm sorry, Mo, he whispered, and he slammed the blade deep into Mo's stomach. Mo went rigid and gurgled. <coughs> and his yellow parka immediately bloomed with a spreading stain of crimson. Jared grunted and jerked the knife upwards, splitting open cloth and flesh. A leaking hunk of Moe's intestinal tract spilled into the snow between them. Moe weakly grasped the knife, and Jared shoved him away. He took two great, staggering steps backward and fell onto his ass. A look of pain disbelief stamped on his face. Then, the agony hit him through the shock, and Mo wailed, clutching his abdomen and struggling to gain his feet. His guts were sliding into his lap. He tried to push them back in, then vomited explosively. Jared turned heel and fled. Mo wailed after him. Why? Why would you do that to me, you bastard? You motherfucker! It's coming, Jared! It's coming! Don't leave me here! Please! Don't leave me here! Don't look back, Jared panted to himself. Don't you fucking look back! Mo's screams became more frantic. He sounded uncannily like the rabbit, moments before it had been torn to pieces. Don't look. You don't want to see this. Jared looked back. He didn't want to, but he did. He couldn't help it. The devil was looming high above poor, hapless Mo, who was screaming his last scream and holding his arms out in a futile attempt to ward off his impending doom. 
he was insignificant before it. A mouse standing in the path of a dragon. A flickering campfire in the face of a tsunami. The whirling mass was roaring, bellowing with an untold number of voices and vocalizations, all of them growling and howling and shrieking as one with cold, insane glee. In the fading light, Jared saw that there were faces in the whirling snow. He saw a blurred, confused montage of hateful faces of all description. Human, bovine, wolven, insectoid. Faces of all kinds. Faces in the whirlwind. There were flashing claws and there were teeth bared for the kill. But the eyes, the eyes were the worst. The faces had blank eyes like windows, and what Jared saw on the other side of those windows made him scream like a woman. For a brief instant in time, Jared, Moe, the devil, and the wind all sang a nightmare harmony of death together that spiraled up and up into the dark slate of the winter sky above them. And then, the snow devil enveloped its prey. Mo was sucked in and instantly shredded in a terrific splatter of blood and fragments of flesh. The spinning column changed in color from a dirty white to a dark, rich red. It sluggishly bore forward for a few more feet, then collapsed. Bloody snow fell heavily to the ground, and the wind snatched at it with a scavenger's furtive greed. Within seconds, not a single trace of Mo remained. Jared turned away and staggered onward, pushing himself to move fast. He had no more sacrifices to offer in his stead. After a minute or two, the wind dropped long enough for the tree line to come into view, and he ran for it, with one hand clutched to his ribs and tears streaming in freezing tracks down the rough plains of his cheeks. He stumbled through the skeletal border of dead grasses and shrubs and fell against the trunk of a birch tree, wheezing and trembling. Complete darkness abruptly fell like a curtain, and he crawled away into its depths further into the woods and away from the field. When he reached the deeper blackness that signified the edge of the yawning gully, Jared stopped crawling and curled into an exhaustive ball in the snow. It was cold in the woods, cold enough to freeze his breath, but he was finally out of the wind. He couldn't feel his nose, cheeks, or his fingertips. Frostbite for sure. But he was alive. Rest for a while. Catch my breath. Then I'll make my way through the gully and hope like hell I can wave down a car on the other side. Get to town, get checked out at the hospital, then blow the fuck out of here in the morning. Go to Mexico, maybe. Somewhere warm. Somewhere it doesn't snow. Not ever. The roaring wind overhead made the tall, straight trees around him creak and rustle. They plucked a screeching, discordant melody on the frayed strings of Jared's nerves. His heart continued to thunder away in his chest and he was sweating in the frigid air. Something wasn't right. Did he hear something approaching? What was that? Jared clambered to his feet, straining to hear above the wind in the trees. There was a crackling of dead branches somewhere close by. A muted thump. A hand clamped down on his ankle in the dark. Shit, fuck, goddammit! He screeched. Then he kicked free of the grasping thing with a spastic jerk of his leg. Another hand clutched at his pant leg and Jared jumped back, thudding against the tree with a winded grunt. It was Dell. His headless corpse had somehow managed to follow Jared all this way, slowly and implacably, crawling through the snow like a remote-controlled toy, feeling searching. Jared ran blindly down into the gully. He ran headlong into trees and thorn bushes, flailing and scrabbling in a mindless panic. He ran and gibbered and sobbed and fell and rolled his way down the slope. Jared started to laugh after a while. 
It was the cracked, hysterical cackling of a madman, dragging itself on its belly. The dead thing followed. Epilogue. Time to feed. Constable Rick Edgemont responded to his second call of the day at shortly after 6 a.m. He was able to arrive at the scene fairly quickly because the first call of the day had taken him right nearby, just over on the next concession. Someone had reported an abandoned vehicle in the ditch. There had been no sign of occupants. The two calls were probably related. The second was from a snowplow operator who'd found someone wandering around on the road, disoriented and suffering from exposure. Constable Edgemont noted that the EMT guys were not on the scene yet, and grimaced. He'd received some basic first aid training, but that was where his medical knowledge ended. He hoped that the guy wasn't too badly messed up. Frostbite could be a nasty business. He pulled up behind the snowplow and noted that the plow driver was standing out in the cold, leaning against the back of the plow and smoking a cigarette with a trembling hand. Edgemont got out of his patrol car and called out. Good morning! I'm Constable Edgemont. I'm guessing you're the one who called us. He crunched closer through the plow-packed snow and added, Gotta say, you look like a man who's wishing that he didn't get out of bed this morning. What's the story? Found a guy wandering in the ditch down there, about half an hour ago. The plow driver's skin was deathly pallid against the dark carpet of stubble on his face. Says his name's Jeremy or something like that. He's in the cab right now, warming up. He's hurt pretty bad. Cut and scraped all to hell. And he says he's got a broken rib. Nose like a squashed tomato on him, too. On top of that, fella's got a real bad case of frostbite all over the goddamn place. Wouldn't be surprised if he loses his nose and ears. Hell, his old goddamn face. Hands and feet, too, I'd bet. Edgemont whistled between his teeth and shook his head. I wish to hell people would heed the weather warnings and stay inside. He motioned up at the calm, clear sky. Now, today's looking like it's going to be livable. Yesterday was a mean one. The guy sitting in your cab probably lost control of his vehicle in a snow squall. I was just checking out a vehicle in the ditch when I got this call, in fact. I bet he went looking for help and ended up freezing all night out there in the bush. Sound about right? The plow driver gave him a strange look and spat out onto the road. Yeah, something like that. Got lost in the dark, I guess. He said that he thought he was gonna die out there. He said a lot of things once he warmed up enough to stop his teeth from chattering. A lot of... very peculiar things. The plow driver made a circular cuckoo motion beside his temple. I think the boy's more than a little bit off his rocker, if you know what I mean. He, uh... Well, I guess you'll see for yourself in a minute. That's why I was waiting for you out here, not in there where it's warm. Frankly, the fellow was giving me the heebie-jeebies something awful. The cop kept smiling, but his eyes were bright and sharp. Well, he's not quite feeling himself, is he? Well, I'll just go have a chat with him then, nice and easy. An ambulance will be coming soon, and they'll take him away to get some proper care. Can you wait here for a few more minutes, sir? I'll holler if I need you for anything. The look passed between the two men, and the plow driver nodded that he understood. Constable Edgemont unfastened the snap on his holster, took a deep breath, and walked up to the driver's side door of the plow. I hope you're not going to be any trouble. Please don't be any trouble. He clambered up into the cab and slid behind the wheel, leaving the door slightly ajar beside him. The man in the passenger seat stank. He smelled of urine and blood and the wild burnt wire stench of terrified sweat. The hood of his coat was pulled up over his head, masking his face. The man was hugging himself tightly and rocking back and forth. He didn't acknowledge Edgemont's presence. There was blood on his coat. A lot of it. Well, I heard that you had yourself a real hard night, mister. Edgemont tried to keep his tone light and friendly. There's an ambulance on the way, but do you mind doing me a favor and letting me have a look at your face, sir? Just so that I can assess any damage you might have suffered from exposure. Please, I want to help you. The man slowly reached up and pulled back his hood. 
Edgemon recoiled sharply. Oh, holy shit. <laughs> he almost got me. <laughs> he whispered. The man's nose was smashed over to the left and was completely black. Multiple frostbite blisters on his cheeks had recently popped, exposing large patches of raw, glistening flesh. He grinned, and the deep cracks in his lips filled with blood. I got away because, because, because I gave them Mo. They, they, they took Mo instead of me, and, and, and now he's, he's with them. In the, in, in the wind. He stopped grinning, and tears suddenly spelled down his cheeks. They, they, they got Bray too. <laughs> wasn't anything left of him. <laughs> that, 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 that wasn't my fault, though. <clears throat> no, 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 not that one. <laughs> you, you can't pin that one on me, fucking pig. <laughs> Edgemont held up a placating hand. Um, no one's blaming anyone for anything, sir. Honestly, I'm just trying to figure out what happened is all. His other hand dropped to the butt of his gun, and it stayed there. Oh, right. Right, fell. That's what happened. He, he, he looks back. I, 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 I told him not to, but he did. He saw... He, he's, he saw the faces in the snow. And then, and then, and then he tripped and he, fu fu he fucking fell. He fell, he fell, but he fucking, he fucking tripped over his own mother fucking feet and then... Oh, oh Jesus! Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, they were on him! Oh, they, they were fucking on him and... Oh, <laughs> there wasn't anything left. Was there anything left? Not really. The wind took what was left and blew it away. The man's eyes were glassy and huge. One pupil was bigger than the other. He rubbed his face with his hands and more blisters popped. Pus mixed with tears and dripped off the madman's chin. I can't... I can't stay here much longer. And Del will be coming soon. The, 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 the ditch... The ditch won't stop him. Nothing... Will stop him. Except... Maybe fire? Fire... F fire melts the frost, right? We, we, we have to burn him. It, it's the only way. Edgemont saw that the guy was starting to hyperventilate. Shit. This is bad. I, I don't know who or what you're talking about, friend, but I can assure you that no one is going to burn anything. Not today. You need to calm yourself down right pronto, and I'm not kidding you. Why don't you tell me more about what happened to you out there? How's that? What's your name? That's a good place to start. Just tell me your name. He's coming for me, you stupid bastard! Don't you get it? He'll drag me back, and then to fucking eat me alive! He coiled to lunge for the cop, and, like magic, Edgemont's 40 caliber pistol was suddenly in his hand and pointed at the madman's chest. He slid out of the cab of the plow and planted his feet firmly on the hard packed snow. Freeze! Don't move! You rest easy and keep your hands where I can see them. Do you understand me? Don't move a muscle. <laughs> I've got money, the madman hissed. Lots of money. I'll give you every penny if you drive me somewhere far, 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 far away from here. Somewhere warm. I'll give you the whole fucking bundle. I promise. Just get me out of here. Sir, you aren't well. You have to understand this. There's nothing coming to get you, do you understand? Now, I'm telling you, I don't want to have to pull this trigger, but if you don't stay right where you are, then that is exactly what I am going to do. I am not going to repeat myself. Stay where you are. The man crumpled in on himself and started to sob again. No, 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 you don't understand, he said. You weren't there. You didn't see what I saw. 
Just take it easy and stay put, mister, and everything will be fine. Where the hell was the ambulance? It would have been nice if the boys from the fire department had shown up, too. Any sort of backup would be helpful right about now. As if on cue, the plow driver poked his head out from behind his plow and shouted, You all right over there, officer? You need some help? No, it's under control, Edgemont hollered back. Stay where you are, please, sir. Tell me if you see the EMT guys coming down the... Look! The madman screamed. They're out there in the field! They're coming! They're coming! The madman came surging out of the cab and went straight for Edgemont. His last word, rising in pitch like a boiling tea kettle, eyes bulging, and his blackened fingers hooked like claws. There was no time to shout a warning, no time to do anything except pull the trigger. The bullets punched through the attacking man's chest and lodged into the driver's seat of the plow behind him, sending tufted fragments of cushion stuffing floating into the air. The madman staggered a few weak steps forward and collapsed onto the road. He briefly tried to crawl, then was still. What the hell, man? You shot him. The plow driver looked on in disbelief. Shit. Well, this ain't good at all. I had to, Edgemont barked. His heart was racing. He'd never pulled the trigger while on duty before. Never. He was crazy. He was attacking me. What else could I do? The cop kneeled in the snow and grimaced at the mess the exiting bullets had made of the man's back. He rolled the dying man over. The front of his coat sported two large, neat holes and was wet with fresh blood. Fuck. What am I even supposed to do here, really? Fucking ambulance, where are you? Edgemont unzipped the man's coat and winced. The wounded man's chest resembled a crimson marshland. It was bubbling. That boy's done for, the plow driver observed. His voice was as dry and cold as the air around them. Heart and lungs had punctured all to hell. Ambulance ain't gonna help him out one bit. Might as well call the coroner. Edgemont closed his eyes tightly. How the hell did this happen? This was going to be a very long day indeed. He did the right thing, I guess. Look, he had a knife in his pocket. The plow operator trailed off, then said, Hey, what's in that bag? Sticking out of the guy's other inside pocket. There was a plastic bag hanging half out of the pocket in question, tattered and blood-speckled. There was a ripped manila envelope poking out of the bag. Gingerly, Constable Edgemont fished the bag out of the corpse's pocket. The envelope was full of money. The two men stared down at it in silence. How much you think is there? The plow driver whispered. His eyes were bulging. I don't know for sure. Tens of thousands, anyway. A lot. There was a rising wail of sirens in the distance, and the plow driver said, The ambulance is coming. A little too late, I guess. Maybe we should. Abruptly, Edgemont pulled a thick wad of cash from the envelope and thrust it into the other man's hands. He looked the driver square in the eye and stuffed the rest of the cash into his own pockets. Then, he crammed the blood-speckled plastic bag back where they'd found it, and it was as if the money had never existed. Do we understand each other? Whatever I say happened out here this morning, well, that's what happened. Get it? The plow driver stowed away his share of the dough and nodded. Good. He doesn't need it anymore anyway. Edgemont said, nodding at the body on the ground. I'm guessing that money probably wasn't on its way to an orphanage or anything, so don't give it a second thought, friend. Oh, I won't. The plow driver stepped back and watched, his craggy face dispassionate, as the ambulance came to a shuddering halt behind the cop's cruiser. He walked over to let the EMTs know that there was no longer any reason to hurry. Edgemont crouched down and murmured, Rest in peace, fella. I'm really sorry about what happened. You shouldn't have lunged at me like that. He patted the dead man on the shoulder and stood up, 
wincing at the twin pops in his knees. Edgemont didn't feel very good about the shooting, but the money made his near future seem a lot brighter. He walked over to his cruiser and pulled a stack of orange pylons and some police tape out of the trunk. The EMTs were busy going through the motions of trying to revive and stabilize the obviously dead body, as they were legally bound to do. The plow driver was holding an IV bag for them. Don't look so dour over there, Edgemont thought. You just had a pretty good payday. Life could be worse. Edgemont set about laying the pylons down on the road, taking his time with it. In a brief minute or two, he would have to get on the radio and inform dispatch of the incident. And then, the shit was going to hit the fan. He exhaled heavily and gritted his teeth. It had all happened so fast. In the blink of an eye, there hadn't been enough time to make another choice. In his mind's eye, he carefully replayed the final seconds of the confrontation. The madman ranting and charging at him with outstretched hands, his fingers squeezing down on the trigger. Hey, what the hell? Would you look at that? Holy shit! Edgemont called over the EMTs. Hey, forget that guy. He's dead. Come over and check this out. Over there in the field. You see that? A snow devil had formed far out in the field across the road, and it was enormous. It looked curiously solid, dense, and the cop felt a vague chill run down his spine as he watched it rip across the vast field at a high rate of speed. It was coming straight towards the spot where Edgemont was standing. The EMTs and the plow driver wandered over, the dead body on the road temporarily forgotten, and they watched the towering thing's approach with rising unease. Hey, the plow driver blinked. There, there ain't no wind out today. How? He trailed off, and the men all shuffled closer together. None of them noticed that Jared's corpse was sitting up now. It opened its eyes. They were twin marbles of frost, dull and malevolent. It grinned and lurched to its feet. On the other side of the road, dead hands reached up from the ditch and scrabbled for purchase in the snow. A headless horror pulled itself over the edge and began to slither across the road, hands grasping and searching for warm, living flesh. Winter is hungry, and it was time to feed.
Tales for Dark Nights.